Okay, we are live, and tonight, or I should say, a couple of episodes ago, we had Park Stevenson on and Victor Vescovo to talk about the shipwreck of the USS Johnston, kind of branched off into the Titanic a little bit, but a lot of viewers, uh, subscribers said that they really enjoyed the shipwreck conversations, so we are going to get into that a little bit more tonight. I hope you, uh, if you like shipwrecks, I think you're really going to like this one because we've got Richie Kohler is going to join us tonight. You may recognize him as one of the deep sea detectives from the History Channel, and he is going to kind of give us a little bit of the background story behind his discovery or I should say identification of the German sub, the U-869. So I'm thrilled to have him on. First and foremost, though, uh, let me introduce some of the other guys. John from the USS Slater, uh, upper left-hand corner. Of course, there's me from History X. Shane from the Buffalo Naval Park, upper right. And then Connor Kilgore, bottom right, from the Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay. Oh, you got it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, wow. I've, I've been practicing all, re all week. And then, like I said a few moments ago, Richie Kohler joining us. Um, well, first, let me say hi. But I got to say, you know, years ago watching the Nova documentary. Um, well, let me just tell you a little bit, bit about him instead of me gushing all over him. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to pull this up and. So Richie Kohler, uh, his background, he's originally out of Brooklyn, New York, rec rec recreational diver who kind of learned the ropes from other experienced divers in the 1990s. A little bit ago, before the episode started, he was telling us it's kind of like the Wild West of, you know, when it came to wreck diving. So he learned a lot from other experienced divers, eventually started exploring the Andrea Doria and eventually came across with the help of some friends came across the site of, well, they didn't really know what it was, but they eventually uh, determined it was the U-boat 869 and it was made popular by a Nova broadcast called Hitler's Lost Sub. That's how I originally heard of this story. It was fascinating. I loved it. And then in, I think it was, and that, that documentary came out in 2000, but then, and this is Richie right here uh, at the time during the documentary, but then a best-selling book called Shadow Divers mm. by an author by the name of uh, Robert Curson. Fantastic book. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I read it when it first came out, read it again recently, and the book still holds up because it's a fascinating, fascinating story. Matter of fact, if at the end, if you want to read this book. Uh, if you want to grab a copy of it, I will. there is a link in the description below on the History X channel. Just uh, click on that. It'll take you right to it. Anyway, moving on. So, well, hold on a second. Maybe I'll let you tell the story. <laughs> well, Rob, first, you getting into it. Yeah. Um, you know, instead of me getting into it and just getting, you know, I'm just thrilled to have you here, first of all. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it, it's I, if you ever said I would have been talking to Richie Kohler from uh, the History Channel, I was like, why would that ever be possible? So, so thank you for joining us. No, I'm a uh, pleasure to be here. You know, it's li listening to you uh, tell my story, so to speak, it, it, it makes me not only reminisce, but it, it's been a wild and crazy ride that literally started with the discovery of this uh, unknown shipwreck, which at first, uh, when it was discovered in 1991 by uh, Captain Bill Nagel and the crew of the Seeker, that boat that's on screen right now, um, everybody on board were amateur divers. They were plumbers, electrician, uh, mostly blue collar guys that, that worked a regular job nine to five, and on the weekend, uh, we'd pack a lunch and go out on boats just like this to go out into the Atlantic Ocean and dive shipwrecks. Um, a select few would plunk their money down on gambles, gambles to go out and find virgin shipwrecks. And I, I wasn't on that uh, Labor Day trip when 
the seeker went out with a full uh, crew to go out and look at an unknown mark or a target on the bottom. Sometimes these things are just rocks. Sometimes they're old barges. But in, in the Labor Day of 1991, they stumbled on what was arguably the remains of a World War II shipwreck. Um, because it was so deep and the conditions turbid and they couldn't see much, uh, there was a little bit of an argument. Some people thought it might have been a barge. But uh, one person, John Chatterton, had seen what he believed to be an angled hatch. And although his uh, brain was numb with narcosis, uh, that's John right there, mm -hmm. uh, he thought he saw a torpedo inside it. Now, when they came back, the first thing they did was they started looking in, in a lot of the dive books and guide books and uh, historical references to shipwrecks off the coast of New Jersey. And there was no submarine lost in this area. So what John uh, had seen, a lot of people ridiculed. It would be the second trip out to this wreck site um, when two things would happen. Uh, the first would be that the visibility was a little bit better and, and John was able to confirm it was absolutely a submarine. It's nationality unknown, but tragically the, the shipwreck took the first of what would be three lives um, over the six years it took us to identify it. Uh, um, Steve Feldman was diving uh, on the wreck when uh, he experienced some kind of difficulty and passed out underwater. And it wouldn't be month; it would be months before his body would be recovered. Oh, and oh, and that, and that that's really where I come into this story because I hadn't been party to those first two dives. But um, with the death of Steve Feldman, a lot of people realized that this, this wreck was dangerous. It was deeper than uh, what they had been diving. Um, this was a time when technology was uh, pretty much unchanged from when Jacques Cousteau introduced us to scuba diving. Everybody was breathing air. They were just using scuba tanks on their back. There were no diving computers. There was no mixed gases. There was nothing that we use today that would have made these dives any safer. And, and so I got a call from one of the members of the crew that said, hey, we're going back out to this mystery submarine. Would you like to come? And um, I said, yeah. I mean, this is the kind of thing I lived for at that point. And how old, how old were you at the time? Um, I was just about 30 years old, just uh, 29 years old. And you'd been diving since you were a teenager? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, before that, when I was nine years old, my dad introduced me to scuba diving in the beautiful waters of Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> 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 which is where we lived at the time. But, you know, uh, um, one of the things that's kind of humorous about this adventure is that, you know, at the same time, the Apollo space program was going off, Neil Armstrong's walking on the moon. My dad took uh, scuba diving lessons, brought me with him, and I sat at the edge of the pool. And for this little kid from Brooklyn, uh, as I watched my dad disappear beneath the weight, the, the surface of the pool, pulling that double hose regulator over his head, it wasn't hard for me to imagine, you know, that he was like an astronaut. And so I realized at a young age, I may never become an astronaut, but I could become an aquanaut. And so my dad uh, has always been the kind of father that uh, enabled his children to do things, to touch things, to, to try things, whether it was a, a chainsaw or a shotgun, skill saw, working, driving motorcycles, whatever it was, uh, he enabled us. And so he strapped that tank on me when I was nine years old and tied a rope around my back and uh, allowed me to, to go right off the back of our family boat in the harbor, uh, literally at the dock. And, um, and that was my first exposure at nine years old to scuba diving. At 15 years old, I was now old enough to become certified. And I've been diving literally uh, with the exception of two years uh, when I had uh, some family uh, issues going on. I've been diving every year ever since. Now, I've, like I said earlier, uh, you know, I've known about the documentary a long time. I've watched... Uh, other videos on YouTube. Of course, I've read the book Shadow Divers. In a lot of the other videos that I've watched that involve you, some of them are diving uh, channels. Obviously, none of our none of us are divers, so we're not going to ask you about the technical aspects of diving, things like trimix, that type of thing. But 
you do mention quite a bit that you were kind of brought into this group of divers that were doing things that I don't want to be too dramatic and say, well, it never been done before, but it wasn't common practice. Is that, is that fair to say? That, that is very fair to say. So in, in um, 1980, I graduated high school. I moved back to New York, uh, the New York area, and I fell in with a group of older fellows. So most of them were married, had children. A few of them were Vietnam vets, and they were do, doing dives that were way outside of the limit of sport diving. These were uh, dives that were uh, giving them the nickname, the thugs or the crazies, because uh, when dive boats would go out, these guys wanted to stay down longer or go deeper. And uh, the, to give you an idea, at that time, the, the sport diving limit in 1980, which was widely accepted, was 130 feet. And this group was regularly diving deeper than 200 feet. And the problem when you go deeper and breathe air is that you suffer something called narcosis, which is a debilitating effect that, that basically uh, is akin to uh, getting drunk. And uh, as you can probably imagine, when you've got a finite uh, breathing supply and you're uh, weaving yourself into broken ships, traveling inside them uh, uh, at great depth with, again, the clock ticking, uh, being drunk is not a good idea, but yet... Uh, with experience and uh, patience and working your way up to it. Uh, these guys took me under their wing. They, they taught me how to use uh, more advanced equipment, like you're looking at in these pictures, dry suits rather than wetsuits. So we were uh, adapting commercial technology and commercial diving equipment for sport diving. Um, and we operated as a team. And, and so Although they were nicknamed the crazies of the thugs, uh, we eventually uh, adapted a much more respectable name, which was the Atlantic Wreck Divers. And, you know, when you say to yourself or, or when people question me and say, well, why do you why were you going deep? Well, the reality is that a lot of the shipwrecks that had been located off the New York and New Jersey shore in the 70s had already been dived uh, extensively by the early divers in the 60s and 70s. So for us to find prized artifacts like ship's bells or portholes or crockery, uh, we had to go further afield. We actually had to go further offshore and deeper. And uh, you know, there's, there's many experiences you can have diving, um, whether you, you love the interaction of marine life, uh, just the feeling of weightlessness. But I have to tell you that of all of the experiences, one of the things that to this day keeps me uh, diving is that feeling when you go down the anchor line and you know for a fact you're the first person to see this ship. You're the first one that has found something that has been lost. And all the shipwrecks uh, uh, that are naturally occurring, meaning not the ones that are sunk on purpose, um, they're, they're surrounding uh, drama and tragedy. You know, a shipwreck by its very nature is a tragic event. And quite often there's great loss of life. And each one of these stories is a unique dive, if you don't mind the pun, into the past. Whether it's a, a ship that was sunk in an act of war, a collision, or a storm, when you're pulling yourself down that anchor line and you see it, that, that whole story plays out right in front of your mind. And then when you're decompressing and coming back up, it plays over and over in your mind's eye. And all you want to do is get back. Well, and, and let me ask you about going down that anchor line, or I guess even before that, because again, this is the 1990s. Um, GPS was just getting started at the time. Didn't exist. Well, yeah, that, that's probably true. Or if it did exist, it definitely wasn't mainstream, right? Yeah, no, we were using Loran. Loran yeah. A and Loran C, which was yeah. before, yeah. And, and as you said, you know, getting to wrecks that were either unknown, un, uh, you know, that hadn't been located yet. The beginning of Shadow Divers, which that's this book right here. Um, the link is in the description of the, below of the video. They talk about kind of like a clandestine meeting between Bill Nagel, who... Um, built the seeker 
it, all of this stuff was kind of kept secret. Isn't that correct? Yeah. You know, uh, Bill ran a commercial dive boat, which basically means that he was making a living uh, taking scuba divers to shipwrecks. And so if he uh, was able to uh, steal customers away from other dive boats by telling them, hey, I've got this new shipwreck. And, and, and you know, for some of the people, it wasn't about artifacts. For some of the people, it might be just to, to go and take pictures and, and be somewhere that no one else has ever been. For some of the people, it was about collecting lobsters or scallops or shooting fish. So every diver had a different reason, but everybody loved the opportunity to go to the, to the path less traveled, if you will. And, and again, it's, it was becoming in the um, 90s rarer and rarer for a diver to have that experience because we were kind of limited to a depth of about 200 or 250 feet by the equipment and, and the technology that we were using back then. And so without being able to go any deeper, we've kind of hit a wall and that wall was a depth limit of how far we could go. And the submarine that uh, is the subject of the book Shadow Divers was literally dangling on that edge of where it was safe to dive and where it was um, at that point where air becomes poisonous and you can either die of carbon dioxide poisoning, oxygen poisoning, or you can do something stupid because you're suffering from nitrogen narcosis. So it's the, the very gas that you need to survive at the same way uh, can kill you. When, when you were invited to join up on these, these trips to dive on and try and figure out what it was, because you had said at the time, John Chatterton thought he had seen a torpedo, but you said there was also maybe a little bit of narco narcosis going on. What did you think it was? You know, um, at the time, I didn't doubt John that it was a submarine, but uh, John believed it was a World War II U-boat. And there were no U-boats listed as being sunk off the coast of New Jersey. But there was an American submarine that was lost. It was being towed uh, um, from Philadelphia up to, uh, up to Maine, and it broke its toe and, and sank in bad weather. And so uh, I was being a little pragmatic and thinking, well, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. If you think it's a submarine, well, there's an American submarine that had been lost. And it must be that submarine. And, and so when I went diving the wreck on that very thir that third trip um, after Steve Feldman had died, and that's actually me on that, on that dive, on that, that my first dive, um, I was uh, looking to find an artifact, and I'm actually holding an artifact in my hand there, uh, that would have American writing on it. I was just looking for anything that said made in Chicago, patent <laughs> number, anything like that, which would conclusively prove that this was a World War II submarine that had, uh, American submarine that had been lost. It just seemed to fit. But on that very dive, uh, where I, here I am in the after compartment of the submarine and I'm holding uh, what appeared to be a canteen. Uh, John Chatterton was entering the forward end of the submarine and he found uh, uh, some crockery. And um, this occurred on the second dive of the day and the weather had been very rough. And only two divers made that second dive that day, myself and John Chatterton. And so as I ascended up the line, John Chatterton was above me and I could see in his mesh bag um, that he had found some crockery. I could see the white bowls, the bone white china. And um, so I, I ascended a little bit and I can to this day still recall how incredibly excited I was when I spun the bag around and I saw exactly what you have on screen. I saw the eagle and the swastika with the year 1942 and I was totally electrified. I'm like, what is this? This is this doesn't make sense. This is mm -hmm. not supposed to be here. And it started uh, not only with myself and John Chatterton, but with a, a collection of other divers, uh, a, a fever, if you will, to be the men to identify it. Because 
it was truly an enigma. John, at the conclusion of that dive, had uh, we all went home. We all went to our, our libraries and started saying, well, how did this submarine, you know, fall through the cracks? How did, how did a Nazi U-boat wind up off of Atlantic City, New Jersey? And no one knows. So over that winter uh, of 91, 92, we reached out to different experts. We, we contacted uh, the, the U.S. Navy. We contacted the German Navy our, uh, based in New York City at the, their uh, naval attache. And um, we came away with the fact that neither the United States government, the federal German government, no historian and no expert, none of the authors that we could contact that had written books on German U-boat operations could answer the simple question, what submarine was this and why was it off New Jersey? And uh, we would then spend literally the next five years of our lives and dedicate treasure and marriages, uh, um, our youth and our sanity to try and figure that out. Were you married at the time? I, I was. And, you know, uh, when the first fatality occurred, I wasn't on the trip. But uh, in the third year of diving the wreck, uh, there was a father and son team, Chris and Chrissy Rouse, that had come out with us, and uh, they were very accomplished divers. And uh, Chrissy was uh, uh, a hellion. He, uh, the, the son, was just, he was positive he was going to go in there and, and find something that would help identify the wreck. And on one of his dives inside, he ran into trouble. I'm not going to uh, uh, dedicate too much time going into the effect uh, of what happened, but he, he basically became pinned inside the wreck and his father uh, had to try and unbury him from the debris that had fallen on him. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you only have a finite amount of breathing gas or air in your cylinders. And by the time they came out, they were dreadfully low on air. And, uh, they had more complications. They lost the line, the anchor line, and they tried to make a free ascent. And it was just one bad thing after another happened to them until finally uh, they made a decision to come to the surface. And um, as, as many of your viewers who, who may know something about scuba diving, uh, you can't simply just come to the surface at these depths. You have to do something called decompression. If you don't do your decompression. If you come straight to the surface, um, you can suffer a, a, a disease, a malady that is called the bends or decompression sickness from coming up and not allowing the bubbles in your blood to dissipate through normal respiration over a period of time. And so the Rouses came right to the surface and uh, Chris, the father, made sure that we got his son on board the boat uh, before he died, literally in mine and John Chatterton's arms on the back of the boat on the ladder as we were trying to carry him up. His son, uh, who again was built like a Spartan um, and, and fought for hours, ultimately would die hours later at a hospital. Um, he had been evacuated by Coast Guard helicopter, but you can't uh, alleviate or, or get rid of that much decompression and not have an extreme detrimental effect, whether it, it would be paralysis, brain damage, or in the case of, uh, of, of Chrissy, basically his heart, just his young heart just could not handle the, the stress of what the decompression sickness had, had done to him and he passed. So after that, after the, the, the fact that this wreck in three years uh, took three divers, it started to stress my marriage. At this point, I had two small children and my wife did not understand why uh, I wasn't diving with my friends, the Atlantic wreck divers and having fun. What was it about this Nazi submarine that had me uh, under its spell? And, uh, you know, there, there's, at the time I had difficulty uh, answering it. Now, 30 years later, uh, I could look you in the eye and say, well, you know, life gives us opportunities and, and, and sometimes we don't recognize them um, for what they are at the moment. And this submarine was an opportunity. It was an opportunity 
for John and I to do something at the beginning of this adventure. I, I just wanted another bit of memorabilia. I wanted a, a, another artifact. I wanted a, a dish with the eagle and swastika to put with all the other stuff and artifacts that I had collected from shipwrecks during my, my, my earlier career. And, and what happened is my outlook changed because inside this broken submarine, unlike any other shipwreck that I had dove before, uh, you could clearly see the remains of the 56 men crew. And it was incredibly sober. Um, to give you an example, I had made many dives on the Andrea Doria, and there had been 50 fatalities on that, but you don't see the remains of, of these uh, of, of the victims. They're, they've been absorbed by the sea. But inside the, the anaerobic environment of the submarine, in the still water, uh, the skeletal remains are still there. In some cases, with tattered bits of uniform or boots with a leg jutting out. And I don't know what it would say about me or my morality to be a person who would enter such a site and not be affected by it. When people, uh, other people that uh, I would talk to would go, well, they were Nazis, you know, they were the enemy. I understood that. And I understood that in, in 1945, um, it, I would have probably been on an American destroyer and I would have dropped depth charges on them and kill them because they were the enemy. But in 1991, in 92, 93, 94, they were lost souls. They were soldiers who fought their battle. They died. And no one knew where they were or who they were. And that haunted me. It haunted me to think that these men somewhere in the world had family, whether it was uh, uh, mothers or fathers, most likely brothers, sisters, children, wives, that didn't know where they were and what happened to them. And so I felt a personal sense of responsibility uh, to solving this mystery. And, and my wife didn't understand that. She, not that she didn't understand the, the concept behind it. She didn't understand me risking my life to do it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, that would create stress. Um, you know, you try to run a business. I, I, I had a business at the time. And uh, of course, you know, when Bill Nagel would call me up and say, hey, the weather's looking good. It would, you know, I would take off work. I'd close my shop because, you know, the, the good weather days that we could get out to the submarine were far and few. And of course, this was another area that would, you know, cause difficulty with me and my wife and of course my business associates and customers and stuff like that. But I, I felt compelled. And, you know, the, the thing is that um, there was no book shadow divers. There was no Hitler's lost sub. There was no reward for doing this. There was just the feeling in my heart that this was the right thing to do. When you, when you first go down there on your first trip out there and, and you see, well, features like this, um, you know, basically anything and you already you know have an idea or an assumption you were at least thinking that it was an american submarine Th that uh, is that's correct i you know the the outline the shape of it again in the limited visibility and with narcosis uh in your mind you just kind of try to focus on small features not the big picture mm -hmm. the big picture you put together over a series of dives or you do it by collecting photographs like the ones you're, you're showing right now. You take these photographs and you kind of piece them together and then you compare them to historic photographs. But at the time that you're diving, um, and, and this is even evident today, we go into the water with preconceived notions and we are hoping that our, our assumptions are correct. And, you know, I on that third dive, as I ascended, I was still convinced it was a an American submarine until I turned that bag around and I saw the dishes with the swastika and I was totally floored. So how much time are you able to spend down there? Um, back in 91, when we were diving air, we would stay down for a maximum of about 20 minutes of which it would take you about three to five minutes to swim down. 
and then it would take you about 90 minutes to two hours to come back up and do your decompression. So you couldn't just swim back up. You had to spend mm -hmm. about 90 minutes to two hours of these decompression stops to ascend safely to the surface. Now, again, none of us are divers, but when you see stuff like this and some of the other images you supplied to me uh, earlier today. Yeah, these are all my images. That That's an image inside the diesel motor room. Um, I, I kind of like it because you see the little lobster sitting up on the shelf. But if you look carefully, you're looking at a workbench in the center and you can actually see a vice yeah. sitting on the workbench and surrounding you are, uh, you know, some of the fixtures that were part of the interior ventilation and exhaust system for the two diesel engines, mm -hmm. which would be to the left of this photograph. Um, at this point, Shane, John, Connor, what questions do you guys have? Uh, Shane, do you want to go first? Yeah, I just had a quick one for Richie. Uh, wow, very compelling story. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, telling it and telling it as honestly as you are. Uh, do you remember now that after the fact, do you remember what part of the sub uh, you uh, saw first or that you came down upon uh, from your descent? Uh, I, I, I can, uh, and it, it's an iconic image. Um, unfortunately, I don't believe you have one. I'm going to give it to you, but there was um, aft of the conning tower, the central, the control room area. Uh, uh, where the periscopes are, you could see that that item sticking up right behind the brake. That was the mount for the 37 uh, millimeter anti-aircraft gun. And we were tied in, the, the anchor, if you will, was tied into that high point on the wreck. When we're, we're tying in the boat to the shipwreck, we always seek out the highest point. And as you can see, right after the breakage to the to the right of the of the, the control room the damaged control room you see this little eiffel tower looking device sticking up well that was the mount uh for this 37 millimeter gun and, and i came down and i looked at it and again at the time i didn't know what it was i had um never i had only dove one other german u-boat before and that was a type 7 that was off the off North Carolina. It doesn't look anything like this. It's it, you know it, yes, it's a submarine, but the, the features are totally different. Um, so uh, I I I remember seeing all of these objects and committing them to memory. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the key points is to come away with photographs or video and then compare it to historical or construction photos, and that's how you can help make. Um, an ID of a shipwreck uh, by its type or style. Mm -hmm. John, did you have a question? Yes, but I'm going to wait until later because we'll probably <laughs> answer it. All right. I Okay. I, I've got a question uh, that... A question. What's that? Connor had a question, I think, right? Go for it, no, Connor. No, no, it's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm in the same boat as John. I think I'll wait till later to see if he actually answers it before I ask. So you guys have been going down there. You're you're bringing back plates. You're you're bringing back items. You're bringing back stories. And how long until the word really gets out that you guys are onto something? Uh, well, actually, the, the word got out um, immediately after that third trip. When when John Chatterton surfaced with the dishes. Uh, the boat's owner, Bill Nagel, called uh, the Star Ledger, which is the, one of the largest newspapers in New Jersey, and told them um, that he had located a Nazi submarine. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the reason why he did this was multi multifold. He, he did it because, number one, he knew that other boat captains uh, were going to be coming out to the wreck because the word got out after the second trip and there was a dive a diving fatality when Stephen Feldman died. And so now the word was out that he had found a submarine. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, it was a competitive business running a dive boat. You wanted to have people coming on your boat the same way that any other business wants to, you know, get all the patrons they can. And so he wanted to make sure that the word was out 
Bill Nagel and the Seeker identified this as a Nazi U-boat. And none of us were prepared for the response. It must have been a slow news day because it made the front page of the Star Ledger. All of a sudden, uh, uh, area news uh, uh, newscasters came down and, and Bill and John were on the local news uh, that night. And, you know, they, they stayed in touch with us for a few months, but when no answer or no identity was forthcoming, um, you know, their attention waned, but they, they kind of stayed in touch with us uh, as the years went by. And of course, um, one of the things that uh, we did was, you know, we would reach out. When I say we, I mean, primarily myself and John Chatterton, but there was a number of other people that did a lot of the ground work, meaning going down to the National Archives, contacting uh, um, historians, going to the U-505 Museum, a German U-boat that's in Chicago, Illinois, um, and looking at it to, to learn more about German U-boats. Um, one of my contributions was to reach out to the Ministry of Defense uh, uh, in Scotland Yard uh, concerning German radio transmissions. Um, you know, this was one of the things that we were trying to uh, figure out was, you know, how did a U-boat get all the way to America and no one knows that? And, and we had been told by other historians and archivists slash experts that um, the Ministry of Defense uh, in Scotland Yard basically holds all of the English records of their Enigma decrypts, basically eavesdropping and, and, and decrypting German radio messages. And so I became friends with a curator there, a gentleman named Robert Coppock. And you realize this was before the internet, boys. This was, we were operating with fax machines and letters. My first contact to Robert Coppock was a letter in the mail, in the mail. And then he mailed me back. And then we did that for a while until we realized we could fax each other. And then, so you can realize how slow the process was of getting information, but it, it truly created a, a, an international connection of people that were interested much like you guys in naval history, uh, but their particular area was German U-boats. And, and we enlisted their aid and they realized that we were the sharp end of the stick. You know, every one of them said the same thing to us. The answer is on the U-boat. Go find it. You know, they pointed us in different directions and 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 different ways. Um, some helped us. Some some didn't bear any fruit. But you know, one of the things about it that you know jokingly makes us detectives was the fact that we had to keep narrowing down the field. I'm sure you guys have played that game called Clue where you've got to, you know, check off all of the different things. Well, that's what we were doing. We were playing Clue. We were going to the wreck, finding items, finding objects, taking measurements, coming back, and using that to eliminate the possibilities of which submarine this could be. And as uh, um, people who've read the book understand about the difficulty of going 60 miles offshore and 230 feet down, there were some seasons we only got three days out on the wreck. That's it. Three days of a year. And so you had to make that happen. You, know, you had to make it count. And then you would come back and you would do your research and, and, and follow up with that. And so in the end, prior to actually finding a tag which identified the wreck, we had narrowed it down to three possibilities. It could only be one of these three U-boats. And that was based on information and data that we collected from the submarine. Well, and, and let me let me jump let me jump to that because um, what you know, a lot of people say one of the more interesting parts of the story. I consider it actually one of the creepier parts of the story because now you've got this is the handle of I think it's it's more like a a steak knife. This is the handle of a steak knife with a with a sailor's name carved into it, and now all of a sudden you've got not just an item like a plate, but you actually have uh, an item with a name in there. And as soon as this was brought out in the 
uh, the Nova documentary, it, it kind of like, uh, I mean, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but it gives you chills because now all of a sudden here's a name. And when, when you, uh, was it you or John that, that discovered the knife? It was John. John, John had recovered a box from the area of the office's quarters. He wasn't looking for silverware. He was actually looking for the Kriegstag book or KTB, which is basically the ship's log. Mm -hmm. And we had it on good authority that the ship's log was kept in a box um, adjacent to the captain's quarters. And so he was hoping that this box would have that in it. But when he brought the box up, it was nothing more than cutlery, silverware, spoons and knives. And only one of those knives had a wooden handle. And you're looking at it and it had the name Horenberg. And uh, uh, one of the divers on the, the trip that day slapped John on the back and said, you've solved the mystery, John. All you have to do is find Horenberg, and now you know. And so that's exactly what we did. Uh, um, we wrote to uh, the equivalent of the German Veterans uh, Administration in, in Germany, which is called the Vost Organization, and uh, asked for any information. And now the problem is they, they were loath to give anything to anybody, right? You can't just, you know, even in America, I'm pretty sure you can't just write to the Veterans Administration and say, hey, tell me about Joe Blow. You know, they're not gonna do that. So we had to enlist a little bit of aid from uh, other archivists and historians that had some credibility. And then we were able to find out um, that there was only one German sailor, that Hornberg is a very uncommon name. And there was only one of the 40,000 men who served on German submarines. There was only one named Hornberg. And Hornberg served on a submarine that was sunk off Casablanca. And so uh, our experts once again told us, well, the, the knife is a dead end. Somebody, maybe somebody stole the knife, maybe at one point, Horenberg was on this submarine. Um, who knows? But Horenberg and his boat are sunk off Casablanca. So that was a dead end. At least at least that's what the records records showed. That is absolutely correct. That, yeah, that, it was like I think it was like off of Rabat or something like that. Correct. And earlier you made a comment about, you know, you're approaching all these different people that, you know, hopefully might be able to provide some information and one of the people that you approach um, is this guy. Horse spread out. Right. And he was really dubious about what you guys were, were bringing to the table because, yeah, like you said, here's a knife. Hornberg's name is carved into it, but Hornberg went down off of Rabat, off the uh, northwestern corner of Africa. Absolutely correct. So, so the gentleman that's on screen right now runs an organization. Um, he used to, he's passed, uh, called the U-Boat Archive in Cuxhaven. And this is not a state or government funded organization. It is basically like our version of the U.S. Subvets, which is a, a, a private veteran run, veteran funded uh, uh, organization. And you know, at a time, it's important to note that uh, post-World War II Germany, most Germans just really would wish that everything that had to do with the Third Reich would just go away. And yet, Horst Bredow, who was a young man who survived, felt compelled to keep the memory of the U-boat Theron, the sailors, alive. And he created this, this repository for everything you boat And it's not just artifacts. Artifacts are a very small part of it. As you can see behind it, it's reams and reams of paper. It is logs, it is photographs, it is personal stories, it is diaries, it is uh, uh, some of the personal photographs that sailors took and sent home to their families and then the families don't know what to do with them. And so he has collected them and he's collected all of these images. And, and as you correctly said, when we told him, about the knife, he said, the knife is a dead end. The knife is not, the, Horenberg isn't on that submarine. Horenberg is off North Africa. And so you have to go back to the wreck. And that's exactly how you put it. You have to go back to the wreck. And that's exactly what we did. 
was was he supportive or was he kind of a jerk? He was supportive, but um, and I can forgive his. Um, I don't want to say indifference, but you have to realize that huh, it's going to sound crazy, but you mention U-boats and all of a sudden the nuts come out of the, I don't know what it is about German submarines, but it just brings out a lot of crazy people. And what I mean by that is you've got uh, people that are uh, convinced that, you know, Hitler escaped uh, uh, to South America, that Nazi U-boats were loaded with gold and, and priceless art. And every U-boat is filled with, you know, gold. And it's just, Craziness, and 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 I think that you guys have a great appreciation uh, for 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 military uh, operations and the understanding of that. And that's not to say that submarines didn't transport gold here or there, but you know there there are people that believe every time uh, a, sh a submarine's found that you know it, it, it was carrying Hitler and gold. And believe it or not, we actually thought that too at the beginning because it's like, hey, here's a submarine that nobody can explain. So, uh, uh, you know, we, we went through that little phase and, and Horace Bredo has to deal, had to deal with that on a regular basis. He had to deal with crazy people uh, pestering him or calling up with phantom U-boat stories. And, and so uh, until we were able to literally show him video, which we did, uh, um, and, and, and bring artifacts to him from the U-boat itself, uh, then he realized that, hey, these guys really do have a mystery, and he did everything he could to assist us. But um, as, as, John, as John so eloquently says in the book Shadow Divers, he had spent a week at the, uh, in Germany and, and met with Horst Bredow. I could not accompany him on that first trip. And Horst Bredow slid across the table a piece of paper with the number of five different U-boats. And he said, it has to be one of these U-boats. John looked at the list and he wrote me a postcard and sent it to me from Germany. I still have it to this day. And it says, we know more about our U-boat than they do. Because <laughs> it couldn't possibly have been any of the U-boats that Horace Brett Al had uh, uh, said it was. Because at, the, at the time, was it these U-boats here that were identified as wrecks off the coast? He was believing it was one of the U-boats that had been lost and, and, and unsunk off America, but that the U.S. Navy had made a mistake of its location by hundreds of miles. Got it. Okay. Because that, that made a, a better, a simpler answer. Kind of like the way I approached it and I said, hey, look, there's an American submarine in the area. It must be an American submarine. I think Horace Bredow looked at it and goes, hey, there's five U-boats lost off the East Coast. It's got to be one of these. And, and so it was a, a basically, an, I think, an oversimplification. How long until these guys get involved? Ah, so <laughs> that's I mean, Because this is, you know, none of us would have really even known the story or you wouldn't have even really come into the mainstream. Not you at know. all. Well, you've got, you've got Nagel you know, going to the papers. And of course that makes big news, but it kind of almost still stays in maybe not the local community, but it, it's not widespread. And, no. and until the Nova documentary came out, I mean, people like me never knew about Shane. I mean, what did you know about this story? Did you, were you familiar with this before we had Richard Richie on tonight? I am absolutely coming at it completely virgin. Okay, so you're, you're, you, you weren't familiar with it. I know no. Connor wasn't familiar with it. He's a lot younger, but um, John knew about it. What Was it the documentary, John, that, that you had first heard about? No, actually. Uh, in middle school, I just went to Barnes & Noble, and I would always go to the World War II section, and one day I picked up Shadow Divers and read it. So this would be about 2006, 2007. Uh -huh. I, I, got my, I still have my copy on my bookshelf right next to me. <laughs> and I will correct you. I actually have seen the Nova documentary, so I am somewhat familiar with the story, but okay. it has been a while. I wasn't so, able to find the book before the broadcast. Well, that's fine. So, all right. So Connor, Connor saw the documentary. I saw it when it first came out. I want to say that was November of, I think I even made a note here. The document that came out November of 2000, correct? I think it yeah. was. Oh yeah. yeah. The, the document. But um, you asked the question, which was, how did they get involved? Yeah, and, precisely, precisely. So, so how did they get thrown into the mix? It, it's a crazy story. Um, 
while we're working on the U-boat, um, the brand new internet came out. And, and I mean, it was like brand new. Uh, and uh, a girl I was seeing at the time, I had since been divorced from my wife and I was now dating, uh, brought me a story and she said, hey, look, I saw this on the internet. And I'm like, what is it? And she says, they're going to recover a German U-boat from Boston Harbor. And I'm like, this is a crock of bull. Tell me, tell me, what are you talking about? And she says, look, it's a PBS Nova. They're going to make a special out of it. So I actually cold called WGBH television studio here in, Bo in Boston and said, hey, um, I, I read a, a, um, on an article that you guys are – supporting a uh, endeavor to salvage a U-boat in Boston Harbor. And um, they put me in touch with a woman named Lauren Aguirre. She was a science editor. And I asked the same question and she says, yes, we're, we are working with, uh, and she mentioned their names. And I said to her, it's a bullshit story. <laughs> there's, there's no U-boat in Boston Harbor. And, and you know, you can hear the phone get silent for a minute. And I'm like, listen, Boston Harbor is not not even 100 foot deep anywhere, okay? Let's start with that. And if you think a German U-boat would actually come into Boston Harbor and then be sunk or scuttle itself and nobody would know about it except these guys, and let's just say your story is true, do you really think the German government is going to allow someone to pick up a war grave, scrape out the German sailors and make a museum out of it? This is a bullshit story. She goes, well, what makes you an expert? <laughs> and I said, well, I found one. We're working on one. So I had to, with my handy fax machine, fax her a couple of uh, pages that, uh, you know, from, from the uh, Star Ledger newspaper articles. And uh, she called me back and says, can you come into Boston? And then next day, I, uh, well, that, that night I called John. I said, John, um, I need to borrow your dish with the Eagle and Swat sticker and uh, a couple of VH tapes of uh, videotapes of the wreck. And he goes, why? I go, well, I'm going to go to Boston. And one thing led to another. I, I met with them and uh, I, I literally shocked them. Um, you could see that whoever was selling them this kettle of fish uh, wasn't able to produce not even one iota of what I had. I had video of a shipwreck. I was telling them the location. I had given them the past three years of work that we had been doing. I told them the names of all of the experts we were working. I had prepared all of this. And I didn't even realize that I was being on. That's another thing about, you know, when you go in and you deal with TV types, you don't realize that in a way it's kind of like an audition. You don't know you're being auditioned, but they're looking at you and uh, um, the way you are uh, right now, they're, they're listening to you and they like your, your, your animation. They, they love your energy. And I had all of that. And so one thing led to another and they said, Hey, how can we help you? And I go, well, um, if you help us finance us to the wreck. So we, we basically work with them and they would come out with us and they came out for one summer. We were no closer to identifying it. And then they, they didn't come out and then they were out with us again. And that's when we had gotten a clue on how to solve the mystery. And the rest, as you've seen on television, is history. Did you at any time meet with Paula Absol? Absolutely. Paula was the woman. Uh, she was the head at, at that time. She's since, I believe, retired. Um, has, yeah. And I will tell you that uh, um, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman, wonderful person strong person. She was like pointing at me, like trying to pick apart my story to see if I was, you know, one of the crazies that come out when you say you vote. And I'll never forget how mortified she was when I laid the dish on her desk and you could see her with her finger. She, she, she wanted to touch it. And yet at the same time, I think as a Jewish woman, uh, mortified, horrified by by the the physicality of this 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 swastika I had placed on her desk, um, mm -hmm. but she had to touch it, and she can you could almost feel in the room the electricity uh, that had like was jumping from this dish, the negative energy, if you will, 
and it was palatable in the room. And um, uh, in the back corner was a gentleman that I didn't re didn't know at the time. I would later find out uh, he was a producer who we would work with to to uh, come up with Hitler's Law Sub, a gentleman named Kirk Wolfinger. And he, he told me years later, he said, you had it right then and there. When she saw that dish and was you, she just felt like, oh, we have to have this store. We have to do it. And they, and they did. They, they worked with us. And the only thing that we really asked of them was to help pay the freight. After the first three years, nobody wanted to go there anymore. I mean, there, there were many trips where it was literally John and I, just John and I on the boat, paying the fuel to get the boat all the way out there. So uh, asking Nova to help us, basically asking the production crew to help come up with the fuel. And, and so that's how they got so many days going out there and, and getting the background. And of course, you know, we were shooting the video. We were the ones shooting the, all the underwater video for them. But at the same time, uh, um, we were, again, picking away, picking away at trying to figure this thing out. For, you know, pro there's not going to be too many people that know who Paula Apsel is, but she was, oh, you know, she's retired now, but she was an executive producer for Nova at WGBH in Boston. Mm -hmm. And she was the one that really held the strings. Well, I came across her with the story of the Keybird, the B-29 bomber that was discovered up in Greenland. And she pretty much was the force behind the scenes on that one, you know, as well. So I interviewed her about that. You're right. She is pretty amazing. But uh, you had mentioned Kirk Wolfinger. Is, yes. is he back from Lone Wolf? Lone Wolf, exactly, yes. So what was it like bringing the Nova team out to this dive site to all of a sudden start filming while you're also at the same time trying to explore this German wreck? It was interesting. I had never, we had never, neither John nor I had ever worked with television crews. I mean, uh, John had maybe 10 minutes of experience at the dock when, when the TV crews had come down to interview him and uh, Bill Nagel when the wreck was first found. So all the nuance of having to work with a film crew on the boat was yet to be learned. And one of the things that we found kind of humorous is that, you know, these guys, I, I don't want to say they have more heart than brains, but they had, many of them had never been on a boat and been 60 miles offshore and know what it's like to be on a, 50 or 60 foot boat for, you know, 24 hours. And many of them were just totally seasick. And yet when it was time to work, they would literally get up out of the scuppers. I mean, some of them, that's where they like to be. They wanted to be against the gunnel, you know, and sick as a dog, but mm -hmm. then they would get up and grab the boom and, and do what they had to do. And uh, it was amazing. Um, fortunately, Kirk Wolfinger has got, uh, he's got a lot of experience on boats, having done a lot of different uh, um, water programs. So he never had a problem and, and neither did a couple of his uh, associate producers. But it was just interesting to see how hardcore these guys were to, to get the shot, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, you've got them out there. Uh, Horse Bredow tells you to go back. You've got the wrong sub um go back and get some more information and let me pull the the picture up bear with me a moment i should have had it ready to go but well i should say how are you doing on time i told you that we would only have you on for a half hour and here we are we're an hour and i still you, have you'll edit that you'll edit this all down to 15 minutes don't worry about it well yeah but you're the one okay well you know what fine you're stuck with us uh, All right. If you can't so, tell, I enjoy talking about this. <laughs> oh, I'm loving it. I'm well, absolutely loving this. Yeah. yeah. So, so oh, Brett out tells you tells you to go back. You've got the wrong sub. You need more evidence. You know the fact that you've got a guy's name carved into a knife. It's not good enough because that knife went down, or I'm sorry, the guy that belonged to that knife or that had carved his name into it actually went down off of Rabat Northwest coast of Africa. So you got to go back to the drawing board and you pull up this. Well, there's a little bit more of a backstory to that. So then, uh, please, please, yeah, let us know. Tell us. Okay. So what you're looking at is a spare parts box. Okay. And don't show any other pictures. So 
Okay. We had been working um, where the front half of the submarine is where m most of the crew lived and most of the crew worked. So the, the front half of the submarine consisted of the control room, which is that destroyed, damaged area where the epicenter of an explosion, forward of that would have been the petty officers and officers quarters, and then in front of that would have been the forward torpedo room, which most of the enlisted men would live in. And, and so we had been focusing a lot of our work there. If you went to the back or the after part of the submarine, uh, you would immediately hit uh, the diesel motor room. And then the path going into the electric motor room was blocked by debris. We could never get into the electric motor room but the electric motor room was just that. It was a motor, it was a room filled with two electric motors for operating the submarine underwater. And so there was no bunks in there, there was no crew spaces. It was just the machinery room. So we didn't really want to get in there for any reason. We didn't think that there was any reason to get in there. And then when we were uh, on a winter uh, trying to go back and see what is it we're missing, what is it we're missing. I was thumbing through one of my um, many books on U-boats. And the matter of fact, uh, um, the book is a book by uh, Hank Keats, and it, it, it's called U-boats. Uh, and in it is a photograph of a Bakelite or plastic tag that had a U-boat number on it. And it had, I believe it was the U-352. And I'm like, oh, no, it was U-853. I'm sorry. It was U-853. And I'm like, wow, if we found that, that would be awesome. So I call the author of the book, Hank Keats. And I'm like, Hank, where, where does this tag come from? I know it's from the U-853, which is a German submarine sunk off Rhode Island. But but who whose picture is that? Where did this come from? And he says, well, there's this guy, Billy Palmer. I go, I know Billy Palmer. He goes, yeah, Billy Palmer got it. Hang up on Keats. I call up Billy Palmer. I'm like, Billy, where did you get this tag? Because what tag? I'm like, in Hank Keats's book, there's a tag. It says U853. Where did you find it? He goes, oh, in the electric motor room. There's dozens of them. I'm like, what do you mean there's dozens of them? He goes, well, on all of these boxes of spare parts, there would be the U-boat number and it that, and also what was in the box. And so now I'm questioning, I'm like, well, why would they put the U-boat number on a spare parts box? He goes, <laughs> well, because when uh, they would return from a cruise and they had used parts, mm -hmm. the, the chief engineer would then send the boxes off to be refilled with bushings, bearings, wire, whatever, fuses, whatever it was that they need. And then being German, that that box had a number, number 37, and it had to go back on board the ship in exactly the right location. So all of these boxes were on a master sheet for the chief engineer so that if he needed a fuse, he knew exactly what box, where the box was stored, and that's why they had these tags. And so I'm like, God damn it. I call up uh, Chatterton, and, and a plan is now hatched. We've got to get into the electric motor room. Well, easier said than done. There was a reason why we hadn't gotten into the electric motor room before, and that's because it was being blocked by the escape trunk that used to sit in between the two engines. And I think I'd be, I gave you a photograph of the two engines, and you could actually see this, this huge trunk that at one point was between the two engines, and we used a, a crowbar to pry it out of the way, and we think, all right, now the, the path is clear. We can now get into the electric motor room. But all is, the, it, is it this one? Nope, nope. Uh, it's it's just a picture of. Uh, nope, not that one. <laughs> not that one. <laughs> All right, I'll I'll keep looking for it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, but but so now we 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 were able to get back another five feet, and then we saw a huge oil tank. It basically, on um, that's it. That's what you're looking at. Is you're looking aft. Oh yeah. And there is the port engine. Uh, um and the starboard engine and in between them you can see that round cylinder that was the escape trunk that was wedged right in front and i crowbarred that thing out of the way and it fell in between the two engines fortunately not on me 
And now you can see that there is the daily fuel tank. So basically the way that German submarines operated is every day the uh, engineer would pump fuel from the bunkers into that fuel tank. It would go through a series of filters and then that would gravity feed the two engines on the surface. So that is a fuel tank, a diesel fuel tank that was strapped or bolted to the top of the compartment that has now fallen. And it totally restricted our ability to swim into the electric motor room. Mm -hmm. So that's where John came up with this crazy plan to take off his tanks, um, to swim over the obstruction and get into the electric motor room and recover a box like the one that I was holding. And, uh, and that box now had on it a small tag and that tag positively identified the submarine as the U869. That tag uh, also disproved, and you can see it right there, we just cleaned it with our fingers, um, that the U-boat was not sunk off North Africa, but that it had, an, an effect, come to New York. And it was only after putting things together that we were able to realize that U869 and Commander Neuerberg missed the radio signal ordering them to go to North Africa. Uh, he was originally ordered to operate off of New York and New Jersey, but he had taken so much time transiting around the Faroes, um, uh, avoiding uh, enemy air patrols and uh, um, offensive hunter-killer groups that he uh, burned too much fuel in the eyes of the German high command. So they sent a radio message, which was never acknowledged. And this is the kind of information that I was able to glean from working with Robert Kopic over at the Ministry of Defense. This, this, this information didn't exist in the United States. It was only being held at the Ministry of Defense, uh, basically of their Enigma decrypts. And so all of a sudden the story just fell into place. And, you know, of course, Paula was, was ecstatic because almost on camera, we identified the submarine. And now we could be 100% proof positive when we would knock on someone's door and not tell them what they knew. They knew that in 1945, their, their father, their brother, their husband uh, did not come home. What we were able to do was we were able to tell them what had happened to them, where they fell, and that the people that founded them treated the, treated them and their uh, camaraderie with respect. Now, oh, Richie? Yeah, go ahead, Shane, go ahead. Sorry, so this story now <clears throat> about the about the box with the with the tag on it, how, did, if, I, if you said it, I'm sorry, how long was this after the initial discovery? Almost six years. Six years. Astounding. Yeah. Wow. And, 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 and it took us longer to identify the submarine than it took uh, the American to fight World War II. <laughs> uh, the, uh, you know, you're, you're holding the box here. You clean off the tag. Horse bred out tells you it can't be the 869 because it's supposed to be, you know, off of Africa. Uh, so when you've got the box and you clean off the tag, was that a reenactment for the documentary? Or oh, no, no. We, we, because we were working with um, both Der Spiegel in Germany and uh, with obviously WGBH here in America, we had uh, an agreement to withhold the information until we went to Germany and allowed Der Spiegel to find as many of the family members as possible. They did not want the family members to hear about it on the news. They wanted them to be notified by Der Spiegel. Um, and then if they were willing, then to be interviewed or met, meet us, meet the divers. Um, and so obviously Horst Bredow fell into that too. He had no idea. and. And so his moment that he says it cannot be, it cannot be, that, that's a real TV moment, brother. Mm -hmm. 
and and just because I get curious about this stuff and maybe because uh, you know I tend to hold a grudge from time to time. <laughs> What 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 were you thinking when all of a sudden on the boat you clean off the tag and in this picture here you see eight sixty nine? Are you going hell yeah in your face or it, it was it was I actually it, it was actually a lot more uh, I think anticlimactic. The way that I found out what it said um, was John and I were decompressing and uh, we were at about thirty feet and we had sent that box up in a bag uh, with another dive team on a, on a, on a lift bag, like a balloon. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it floated up. So, so basically those guys on the boat took the bag and they opened the bag and they looked at it. And basically the shot that you're looking at is exactly what they saw. And so one of our dive team, a gentleman named Will Macbeth swam down to us uh, while we're decompressing and on a slate, he had written, the you who now has a name, it's U869. <laughs> and I can remember just looking at John, looking at Will, and John and I just looked at each other and we shook our hands. It's like, we're done. We did it. There was, there was, you know, no, no back slaps. There was, it was a sense of relief. Um, we had narrowed it down to three U-boats of which U869 was one unlikely but one and so we, we you know we had three chances of which one it would be and it was nice because one of the things i had made a commitment uh, was never to uh go even if if nova wanted us to do it i could never sit in the living room of a family member and go i'm i'm pretty sure i found your brother's boat i, I had to be it had to be proof positive you can't you can't just uh, uh, in, 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 in go into someone's home and not be a hundred percent proof positive. You, just, you can't do that um, because what happens when it's wrong? I mean, you know, we, we do a lot of work nowadays uh, helping um, recover lost American airmen. Um, and we never talk about the airplane, the, the crew, the names ever. The government does that. They get the right to contact the family. So, you know, in that same way, back then, I knew that if we never, ever found those tags, I would never go to anyone's house and say, hey, I found your brother or your father. Who do you, who do you work with? Just on a side note, who do you work with or uh, what group you're with that recovers the lost area? Yeah. And we've been, you know, working on um, projects at, I'm not at liberty to go into what projects because they're still ongoing, but in the South Pacific. So. Got it. Okay. And then what was the name of the company again, or the group? The the um, the, the DPAA, I believe. Is okay. the, yeah. Sorry, it cut out for me. So. Yeah. So you've got the you've got the tech cleaned off. You know it's the eight sixty nine. You go back to Germany and you meet up with Horst Bredow. And I found this picture. Is this when you were presenting it to him? That is correct. You can see that we actually have the box, the tag. We have um, one of the um, artifacts that that white piece of uh, aluminum is a schematic for the interior ventilation system of the submarine. And in one corner, it, it said type 9C, and then it said Deshameg Bremen. And that was another artifact that helped us narrow down the field. It told us that that submarine was built at the Deschermeg factory in Bremen, Germany. And so again, it narrowed down the field to only U-boats that, that, that meet our criteria that had been built by that factory. Uh, who else is in here in the picture uh, with you? Uh, I see John Shatterton and I see you and I see Horace. Who are the other two guys? Uh, uh, standing directly next to me is Kirk Wolfinger. Oh, that's Kirk. Oh, that, okay. that's Kirk Wolfinger. Uh -huh. And uh, right behind uh, uh, Horst Bredow is Rush DeNoyer, who was the the writer. Um, and and basically, I I mean, you know, he he pretty much was the the producer behind the majority, the genius, if you, if you will, of telling the story and dealing with Paula and making uh, um, the the story what Paula would call a nova, 
it had to be a Nova, meaning it had to have science. And, and, and I'm sure if you if you watch the program, uh, you realize that Nova is is not your average documentary. It, it is truly an educational program where you know the, the viewer is going to learn not only about the technology of submarines, but about diving, about acoustics for for echo sounding, depth track, whatever whatever the subject matter is. There's a scientific aspect to it that is fully covered. Mm-hmm. I want to I want to ask you about artifact recovery, the controversy when it comes to artifact recovery. But before I do, I want to give Shane and John a, Connor a chance to hit you with some more questions. Okay. Uh, well, I want to ask. You had initially expressed a belief that it could have been an American submarine. Uh, what what submarine was that, and has that one been found since, or is that one still missing? Nope, it, it was found. Um, the name is escaping me right now. Uh, it'll, co- of course, come back to me uh, 30 years ago, by the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, um, it was an American submarine that was being towed and wound up being located by members of the Atlantic Wreck Divers of all. <laughs> uh, they found it off of a uh, spikefish. It was the USS Spikefish, and it's located off of eastern Long Island, New York. Roughly about 60 miles, maybe, as the crow flies from this U-boat. Okay. So it's in the vicinity. You, you know what I mean? The spike fish is the name. Of, so I believe it was the USS spike fish, uh, which was decommissioned and, again, travel, uh, being towed for scrap. So Something we haven't talked about. What's that? How was U-853 sunk? Yes. Ah, U-869. There, okay. there, there's still controversy about this. Um, you see, the, at, at the time of our research, we had gone to uh, the U.S. Navy, um, U.S. Navy Naval Weapons Station Earl. We went to the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Uh, we also went um, down to Carter Rock Explosives down in, um, I think it's Maryland. And showed them video of the wreck, showed them. And they were the ones that said that the damage that we're seeing here is commensurate with a torpedo. Um, And that the amount of damage, how the the submarine's been eviscerated, how the conning tower is is laying on its side. To them, it seemed like it was a torpedo. So uh, somebody came up with um, the idea. Again, you know, John and I are not uh, engineers. We're not explosive experts, we're divers. And, and so one of the uh, people at, um, I think it was Naval Weapons Earl, had mentioned to us that a number of U.S. submarines uh, had uh, combated uh, circular run torpedoes and, mm-hmm. and that the, one of them, the USS Tang, um, had sunk but because of its own torpedo uh, uh, in the Formosa Strait. And so we're like, well, you know, if you're telling us this looks like torpedo damage, then that's it. Um, and, and so that was the, the working theory for many years. Um, and then uh, uh, somebody came forward and said that the, the, the wreck had been depth charged uh, by a U.S. Coast Guard cutter and an American destroyer um, in late, late February or March 1945. So we interviewed um, Captain Judson, who is the captain of the U.S. Navy ship, and he said that, yes, they, they, they did depth charge target, but it acted like a wreck. And when I asked him, well, what does that mean? He says, well, it, it didn't move, and there was no preponderance of debris, no oil came up. And so the, the, the area of discrepancy is how do you blow a submarine in half and nothing comes up. So, you know, John Chattern and I seem to believe that the submarine may have already been dead, filled with water. Everything that would have floated away, floated away. The oil would have floated away because um, both the coiner, the USS coiner and the crow uh, adopt a series of depth charges, but they did not find any debris, no bodies, no wood, no oil, nothing. So uh, with nothing coming to the surface, they declared it just a shipwreck and sailed away. 
And so the U.S. Coast Guard, after about, I think, 15, no, was it maybe it was a few years. It was a couple of years after we had positively identified the rack. Uh, the NOVA program had come out. Shadow divers had come out. The U.S. Coast Guard claims credit for the kill. <laughs> this day, the U.S. Coast Guard claims that it killed the U-869. Um, with, despite the fact that the U.S. Navy, um, to this day, at least in my interviews with the captain, believed that it was a wreck. And so it's subjective. I wasn't there. I don't know. Um, I know that there's definitely depth charge damage in the stern, where you can see that the hull is bent in and pressed down from an outward force. You can kind of see it in that drawing. Of, uh, above the after torpedo room, you can see that it's bent in, and it's clearly depth charge damage. But the center part of the submarine is is blown outward, which uh, again, I'm not an expert, but uh, the experts at Carter said that that was more indicative of an explosion. Uh, now another a person has just come out. A gentleman named Hamilton has written a book, written a book, and said that there's a possibility it was a hydrogen explosion. Um, mm -hmm because of built up gases that occurred when U-boats were snorkeling and that there is evidence of this having occurred in the English Channel with German U-boats. So now there's three, three different theories, whether she killed herself with her own torpedo firing it on a tar tar target, she was sunk by the Coiner and Crow, American destroyer and a Coast Guard cutter, or she blew herself up uh, with an internal explosion and then was laying dead on the seafloor until the corner and crow had uh, ran over it as an anomaly and depth charged it. So the, the thing is that they did not have movement. They just ran over a metal target and they depth charged it, which happens to a lot of shipwrecks in, in, um, in, in uh, the littoral zone um, during World War II. A lot of the shipwrecks that we dive have been blown to pieces because they, were, they weren't taking any chances. So I don't have the answer. Uh, um, that's that's not where my my area of expertise would lay to tell you how she died. I can only tell you how we treated it and how we identified it. Well, before you before we logged on tonight and went live, you caught John and I and Connor kind of <laughs> talking about <laughs> my uh, crazy theory. Well, the theories because he had the action reports. Uh, what was it from the coiner and and the crow? So yeah. Um, the war diaries are available, and I mean, the coroner and the crow were sitting outside New York City, about to start a convoy on February 11th, 45, and they got called to go attack a sound a sonar contact, and you can read all in the war diaries. They're dropping depth charges for hours on this target, and when you plot the coordinates of the crow for 8 p.m. on the 11th, it's 12 or 15 miles away from the wreck. So my theory, and this is just rereading this book and then just coming up with this, is that this sub fired her acoustic torpedo at this convoy that was forming up. It circled back and hit the sub. They sank. And then the two destroyer escorts got the contact, went and depth charged a wreck. Because in, in the war diary, it says, after hours of depth charge attacks classified as non-sub which you could say well they're hitting a wreck so that's my uh crackpot theory right now who knows it's as good as any other my friend yeah <laughs> well i know you said uh a few moments ago that you know these are all just theories but you know and that you're not the expert but i can't in this story think of anybody else who would be more qualified to throw their opinion into the ring so what do you think happened? Yeah, I, you know, one of the things I love to say, which has been my guiding force in diving shipwrecks is let the wreck tell you what, it, what happened. And that's whether or not I'm trying to find an artifact or an answer uh, um, of, of, of the events that occurred. Uh, in this particular instance, um, I've dove a number of German U-boats, and I and and I challenge you guys to look up uh, images of other sunken U-boats, whether it's the U uh, uh, U eight five three, which was depth charged um, constantly for two days, two days, and it's a hundred feet shallower. It's in a hundred and thirty foot of water. 
we have the life raft from conning the tower is up. Zoom. It's conning tower is up, and there's no massive explosion. They literally blew the A53 up until the captain's hat floated up. They literally recovered the German commander's white hat from the water. They recovered bodies. They recovered items, cloth, furniture, and still the submarine remains contiguous. It's intact. There's there's holes punched into it, but it's not split open like a like a can that somebody put in an M80 in. So, Wait a second, John. Is that the uh, U-boat that you were telling us about? That the Atherton. Um, yes. Yeah. The yeah we were just talking about this. Yeah, we were just talking about this a month ago. And John, you said that the uh, the Slater Museum has what from the uh, 853? Yeah. At, at the museum, we have the life raft, some of the debris, and the hat that floated to the surface. It's on display. And, and well, but they and they they uh, sent a diver down. Yep. Um, and of course, the diver was crazy because it was unexploded. Depth charges and hedgehogs everywhere. Yeah. Um, and he recovered one body that was blocking the uh, conning tower. He opened the hatch and, and pulled out a body. And, and they, that, that sailor is buried in, uh, the, um, uh, in Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, it says Ein Bekannter, German sailor, one unknown German sailor. And that was recovered by a U.S. Navy diver. And the, the key here is to answer your question is that that particular submarine is not blown into two pieces. And if you look at the U-701, which was sunk by aerial bomb off the Hatteras, it's remarkably intact. If you look at the U-352, which was sunk by massive depth charging, or the U-85, which was also sunk by depth charging and killed its entire crew, um, they're all intact. They're all one continuous submarine with small punches uh, of depth charge damage. So I, I don't have an answer for you. I, you know, you want me to give a theory. One of the things is that, you know, I always like using experts to tell me what they think. And I'm not an explosive expert. That's why I mentioned that we went to Carter Rock. We, we went to uh, um, Naval Weapons Earl. We went to Philadelphia Navy Yard. We spoke with explosive ex experts. They were the ones that said, this is what it looks like. And we've even had some tests done uh, with uh, um, computer modeling to say, could a depth charge create this damage? And uh, the only way that it could happen is if the depth charge exploded inside the submarine. Hmm. Hmm. So because was, because uh, some of the framework was blasted outward. That's correct. Gotcha. Um, one of the viewers, divers down, asked the question, have you been back? And of course the answer is yes, because you gave me a link to a video that you shot yep. from 2020. That's and so I'm going to let this play while I ask you to... So you're I, now, you're now going into the fo you're you're in the radio room sonar room um the w interior walls are all down I'm going to duck under this harness and that's the doorway now leaving the officers quarters and heading in through the galley uh, we've we've the reason why the film cut is because I don't film human remains um having become really good friends with many of the families I just do not I edit out any human remains. Mm -hmm. And you're now in the forward torpedo room. And to your immediate right, you're looking at the remains of a torpedo. Um, those are pieces of linoleum that at one point lined all of the, the, the bulkheads. Linoleum. And uh, yep, you're gonna, I'm coming over and you can see the aft end of a torpedo right there. Well, that that's pretty clear. That has a hole what? in it? I'm sorry? And the torpedo has a hole in it? Yeah, those are rock holes. Those are just um, uh, corrosion. Yeah, there's a there's a view from outside the wreck. That's actually kind of like the view that John had uh, when he first uh, dove the wreck, and he looked in the open torpedo hatch. He looked down, and that's what you can see. And so I actually shot that picture from the same perspective to kind of give people an idea of what John saw, but. 
he thought it was a torpedo, but he wasn't sure. And the reason it has that, that metal ring around it is to protect the counter-rotating propeller. So there's a counter-rotating, that, that is not kept on when they fire it. That's just for storage purposes, so that no one could damage or ding the propellers. Okay, so then going back to your video. Yeah. So all of the interior woodwork is gone. All of the uh, paneling, the, that's the remains of the toilet, the forward uh, uh, head, if you will. And um, swimming forward now in the uh, foreground, you can see a yellow life raft. Um, there's a lot of that around. You're gonna see some cooking pots and um, large fans uh, that were used for vent interior ventilation. And you're going to notice that all of a sudden the silt is building up mm -hmm. um, on the bulkheads on the port side or the left side up above. You'll start seeing a rack. And in those racks are, are tins that are filled with a carbon dioxide absorbance uh, that they would use if there was an extended um, time that they would spend underwater. Is that one right there? Uh, no, I believe that's just an electrical junction box. Oh, okay. okay. A little, little further up, and then you'll see some more. Um, and the rails, that, that rail that you just are looking at, and then there's a rail to your right, those are the rails that they would use to load the torpedo tubes. Now, mm. that's, that is a light fixture that's just dropped straight down, and I'm, I'm pushing forward now so that I can get as close as I can, and I'm going to, you know, I'm really getting belly into the silt. And you can make out the two uppermost torpedo tubes. Um, and now as I turn around, you'll get an idea of why, because this is what happens when you get in the silt. You just lose all visibility. When when that happens, uh, there's no panic? You don't get nervous? Or... Well, you know, if you're, if you're going to panic in that situation, you're in the wrong hobby. Um, and I don't mean that snide. I mean that with most seriousness, that that – we develop a set of skills uh, depending on the dive. In, in the U-boat, I don't use a line, a penetration line. Um, in many other shipwrecks or in cave diving, you have to have a continuous guideline to get you back out. As, you know, again, it, it seems like I'm being glib, but you're in a tube. You're in a, in literally in a tube. There's no way to change deck levels. There's no rooms. There's just little doorways, and there's all kinds of dangly stuff that can get caught on you. There's lots of bad stuff, but a line is not going to help you navigate around that. So we kind of use a, a trick that I've been using since I was a kid, which is called progressive penetration, penetration, where when you go in, you memorize landmarks. So like when I would be swimming out, if I kept my hand and I touched that torpedo, well, I know that when I get to the shroud, now I've got to dodge right because then there'll be a circular opening to get through the hatch. And it's these kind of things that in zero visibility, you can almost close your eyes and braille dive. That's a term we use, braille dive out. Now, we also try to operate in such a way as to not disturb the visibility as much as possible. But sometimes it's, it's literally impossible. There's just no way that you can enter a compartment that has, you know, 70 years of silk built up um, and not expect that to, to, to just uh, disturb the visibility. So it, it, it's a balancing act, if you will, between trying to minimize your impact inside the shipwreck and also remember. And, and so like this video that I'm showing is just showing gauges and different uh, bits of equipment uh, throughout the summer. You can see the remains of two gauges uh, right there. Their faces long eaten away and all kinds of electrical switch boxes. And this is the problem that we had is that not only has the, the interior of the rack um, been encrusted in this marine growth, if you will, but it's also um, deteriorated greatly. The, the Germans were not using the best of building materials in 1943. So now you're entering, I've, I've jumped ahead so that we are entering the aftermost compartment um, in between the two engines. And you can still see the remains of that trunk. Um, there, there's the, uh, the workbench, the lobster's gone. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can rewind a little bit if you need me to. No, not at all. 
Okay. So you've got your, your you're now looking at the port engine and that's that workbench right there. A lot of the controls for the diesel engines left and right, as well as uh, ballast controls. Um, yep, and there's a, a contemporary photograph to give you a kind of perspective. You can see uh, those are the main air induction valves for closing. Well, here I want to I want to see if I can pause it here real quick. This cylinder hanging from the ceiling is the trunk that was lying on the, for lack of a better word, the floor, right? Well, when, when, I found it, when I found it, it had fallen and wedged itself between the engines and I okay. needed to unwedge it. And mm -hmm. I used a crowbar to do that because it was blocking the way. We couldn't go over it. We couldn't get under it. Did you eventually put it back? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to go to the video and you'll see. <laughs> okay. okay. Hold on a second. So in this 19, in, in that photograph, you could see if you go back a little bit, you can see the uh, the the oil tank is now fallen all by itself in between the engines. See it's wedged up there? Yes. In that photograph. And if you go to the video, you'll see now it's fallen down. And if we had found it this way, John Chatterton would have never had to take his uh, his gear off. You can see the escape trunk um, is, is laying down in between the two motors. And just to give you an idea of how big these things are, if a man is standing on the deck grates, these engines are as tall as a man. So the, the engines are, let's say, two meters tall. So that'll give you a perspective of how deep down that, that um, oil tank is laying in between the engine right now and how disconcerting it is that things like that could fall on you if you were to swim underneath it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. And as Divers Down says, there's a lot of places to get snagged on. As you're filming this video, or any video, taking pictures, whatever, how often are you getting snagged? Uh, you try not to, but it does happen. And again, uh, arresting panic means that you stop, you back up, you find the snag, you get, get it off of you. Um, we try to move in a shipwreck like church mice. You know, you, 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 we also try to be very contained, very, uh, um, you know, uh, very tight with not a lot of things dangling or loose that can can be snagged. So try to be as streamlined as possible. Got it. So now you're going to have a treat because in this video, um, I am visiting the wreck. I haven't been here in, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. And I am like shocked that the end, the diesel motor has fallen down absolutely mind blown because I am swimming now where no one ever could swim before. We can never do this. And now within seconds, I would took John chattered in a, a number of dives to achieve. I am now on the opposite end of the diesel engine room about to go through the square door leading into the electric motor room. Which is which is where John had to go to get that parts box. That is correct, and there's there's boxes there as well. There were some boxes on this end of the shipwreck, and you're gonna see a few as you go as we go into the room. I'll I'll actually make a point. So now now that's the um, starboard electric motor that we're looking at, and you can see one of the boxes sitting on the floor right in front of it, a big one. That guy right there. Uh, to the left side, it's a big square box. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. I mean, it's, it's box shaped. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of the um, electric motor uh, controls are still in place, but uh, the gauges, as you can see, have popped out. Uh, a lot of the aluminum and fixtures, uh, you know, uh, have have corroded to the point where, you know, the, the, you can see the, the fuse box. And this will give you an idea of how things are covered up. I noticed this tag. You can see a square tag but you can't read any writing on it. But then I'm gonna take my finger and I'm gonna rub it. And then all of a sudden, after 70 years now, you can actually read German writing. So you, you can see how things can become camouflaged. And as I move further aft, we come to, uh, there is a welder on the right-hand side and a lathe, there's the lathe. 
That is the lathe right there, and then there's a welder behind it. And there's the access to the uh, uh, after torpedo room. And that is a, a manifold for pressure gauges. You can see another box right there. So there's there's boxes literally uh, all. The, there was a, a couple of, I think 180 boxes of spare parts. And now the, you could see how we couldn't get in on this end because the hull has been bent straight down by depth charge damage, and there was no way to get in. And uh, you know, I'm, as I'm as I'm pushing around, I'm just illuminating and uh, showing different kinds of gauges. And uh, again, as we swim out, I believe uh, I am now out, and there is, believe it or not, the person in that video is uh, Andrew Nagel, who is Bill Nagel's son, and I took him diving and brought him inside the U869 with me, which in a way was something his father never got the opportunity to do. Is is Bill Nagel no longer alive? Bill Nagel died uh, the second year of uh, our work on the on the rack. Oh, I remember reading that in the book. That's right. Um, and he was the one that essentially was the first to discover it. Yes. Not identify it, but discover it. That is correct. He um, he basically traded uh, numbers or locations for an inshore shipwreck with a fisherman for this offshore virgin numbers. So that that trade with a gentleman named Skeets is the uh, impetus for this entire adventure. Um, the video is almost complete, but I'm going to let you. Uh, or yeah, ask you I'm, I'm just swimming out right now, and, mm -hmm. and there's there's uh, Andrew waiting for me, and you can see the two valves above my head right now, which are the main air induction, and you can see the amount of dis destruction of this particular compartment and how the the submarine <clears throat> is totally blown apart. I want to post this uh, comment here. Max uh, Jurger basically says that video is amazing. This video uh, is on your YouTube channel, correct? That is correct. Yeah, that's that's where I that's where you gave me the link. And your YouTube channel is it is it simply just Richie Kohler? Just search for Richie Kohler, and you'll come across it. That's correct. Yeah. So Max or anybody, if you guys want to check out this video again and again and again, I mean, of course, you can see it here. But check out Richie Kohler's YouTube channel. Go over there. Um, subscribe to his YouTube channel if you haven't already. And uh, you can play that video as much as you want. Um, now, are you still good on time? Because we are going way over. Uh, yeah, you're way over. But I, I'd say about another 5, 10 minutes. And then we okay. can call it a day. Five, five, ten minutes, then we'll let you go and we'll talk behind your back after that. But I, de I definitely want to get your thoughts on our artifact <laughs> recovery, the controversy of artifact recovery. Some people say you shouldn't be touching this stuff. Other people like, you know, other people like me, for example, I can appreciate the whole you shouldn't be touching this stuff. It's a war grave. But if you hadn't brought this stuff to the surface, you never would have identified the submarine. So so what is your line of thinking there? So we'll, since we're talking about U869, I'm going to focus on that. John Chatterton and I recovered various objects uh, from the wreck in an effort to, number one, identify it. But along the way, we had to narrow down the field. And so people say to me, well, why were you recovering crockery? If you look at the crockery, you'll actually notice that the Germans put the year on the crockery. It says 1942. Well, you know, we were working our way. We, we actually found crockery with the year 1944. So we knew that the wreck could not have sank before 1944. So the, the recovery of crockery was one of many clues that helped us narrow down the field. Uh, John recovered an escape lung, which was uh, um, basically, to most people would look at it, it looks like a life preserver, but... An escape lung is for a device for uh, mariners or submariners or submariners, depending on your nationality, how they escape a submarine. They put this device in, they can breathe off of it. 
uh, and it, it looks like a life preserver and they can escape from the sunken submarine and come to the surface. That escape lung that John recovered, uh, we had been told by Horse Bradow and other people that some members of the crew would write their name on, on a particular one or on their boots. So we started recovering boots, uh, but then we felt that that was way too personal. So we stopped. We only recovered actually one boot. There was no name on it. And then we realized that there's a quite possibility that someone was wearing those boots. So we stopped that. So every artifact that we recover was in an effort to, to keep narrowing it down. This, this, is, this escape lung is unique in that John uh, um, brought the air cylinder, the oxygen cylinder that was attached to it, back to his house and put it in his garage. And uh, overnight, as it dried, it blew up. We didn't real he didn't realize that it still had pressure in it and that it had been so fatigued from 70 years underwater that it split in two and exploded and blew up his garage. And um, I, when I mean blew up, I mean it blew things off the shelf and you know knocked things down. And uh, but at the same time, it knocked off the encrustation. And on the, the shoulder of it, you could clearly see a manufacturer and a hydrostatic date. And that date was November of 1944. And that was the, one of the oldest things that we had found on the wreck. So that we knew that this, this had to be a late war U-boat. This was one of the last U-boats uh, most likely to sortie. Um, it could have been one of the U-boats that was in uh, Operation Teardrop, uh, excuse me, uh, against Operation Teardrop uh, that had been sent to operate against the United States or particularly New York. So th these were incredible clues. So the recovery of objects like the Horenberg knife was no longer important to us uh, from the collection of them. It became important to the story. And once we recovered the tag with the identifying mark of the U-869, uh, we, re we never recovered anything again. Not only that, every family member that I met um, would invariably ask for me to bring things to the wreck. And if they, they didn't ask me to go get anything, but um, I would offer them. So whether it was crockery, um, whether it was, and, and I'm not going to tell you who I gave what to because I, I respect their privacy, but uh, um, I did give some of the family members uh, uh, artifacts from the wreck um, as a memento or a memory of their their brother or their 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 loved one. Um, we gave artifacts to the U-boat archive, as you saw, uh, because that was the proper place to put them. And uh, that was it. it that, that ended uh, taking objects from the, the U-boat. So the purpose of recovering objects was so that we could identify the submarine and identify the men. And that was it. Now, now when you talk about the big picture of artifact recovery, there's laws in, in, in effect. If a shipwreck is a war grave, if it's a naval vessel that sank, uh, um, regardless of the reason, um, it's considered a war grave and the, the, uh, it's inviolate. The only people that can recover anything from it is their government. Uh, and so you can visit uh, American warships, but you can't take anything except pictures. Uh, if you're in English waters and you're diving British submarines or British Shipwrecks, you have the same rules apply. No matter where you are in the world, uh, uh, we there is a respect of government. Now, one of the things that's unusual about U-boats is that although the thankfully the Third Reich is defunct and gone, the war graves of their German sailors from World War I and World War II is now in effect the property and uh, under the guardianship of the current German government. And the same way that the Hunley the CS Hunley, the Confederate submarine Hunley, is now under the protection of the United States government. They're sworn enemy, but uh, uh, that's who is protecting uh, uh, the wreck. They recovered the wreck. They removed and interred the remains of the Confederate sailors on board. So military wrecks have a very special status, and only the surviving government or the government that is responsible for them can do any recovery. Merchant vessels are a whole other uh, uh, kettle of fish. Um, there's now uh, uh, effects 
uh, policies called UNESCO, which is governing the control of shipwrecks throughout the world. Most of the members of the United Nations um, have signed on to UNESCO, which basically says any shipwreck that's over 100 years old is historic no matter where it is, no matter what it is, and therefore it shouldn't be violated. Um, shipwrecks that are in state waters are protected by the state. Shipwrecks that are in international waters, um, you can recover things from them if they are uh, truly abandoned in international waters. And then, as you guys know, that live around the Great Lakes, uh, the shipwrecks of the Great Lakes are protected because yeah. they are not international waters, they're state waters. And so yeah. they, they fall, fall under state protection. Um, and there are places in the world like uh, Truk, Troop Lagoon in Micronesia, where uh, the Micronesian government has protected all of the Japanese shipwrecks in the lagoon, and it is a diving mecca. People go there. Uh, there's uh, war wrecks in in in, um, in other areas that are protected by uh, government uh, agencies, whether there's civilian wrecks or not. Uh, so you know it depends where you are in the world whether or not it is lawful to to recover auto objects from shipwrecks. Uh, when I was a kid, it was the Wild West. Um, if there were laws, nobody knew about them. And then over the last 40 years, um, not only have the, the laws been enacted and, and, and enforced, but they've been clarified and they've been expanded upon. And, and so today's uh, shipwreck divers, most of them don't recover artifacts. Most of them visit the shipwreck uh, to swim through history, to to get dinner if they are so inclined, and to take pictures. Okay. But before, I mean, that leads to a whole nother round of questions, but we do have to let you go at some point. Um, I'd love to have you back on and even just go through some of the stuff that's behind you. Uh, <laughs> you know, all, all, all lawfully recovered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I have, I have no doubt. But uh, we'd, we'd love to have you back. If uh, is that something you'd be interested in? More than happy. You guys, you guys are great. Yeah, you, you haven't thrown any tomatoes at me, and I had a good time. Uh, oh. Any, uh, any last questions before we uh, let Richie off the hook, guys? No, I just can't thank you enough. Yes, thank you Absolutely. so much for coming on tonight. Yeah, uh, if you can't tell, it's been my pleasure, guys. Yeah. Well, like I, I, sorry, sorry, Ken. I'm sure I speak for all of us. If you're ever at any of our museums, you're more than welcome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's been a it's been a thrill to have uh, Richie Kohler on with us. Um, before we let you go, uh, because I do want to point out, you were uh, over the the summer. I think you were at the. Uh, um, was it a bikini to see the uh, the nuclear? Or to dive on the uh, uh, the nuclear? Uh, no, I, I was I was in uh, over the summer. I was in Truck Lagoon, Chuk. Chuk. Oh, okay, that's where you were. Got it. Okay. Yep. Um, wh where are you going? Where are you going next? I was trying to get to to Bikini, but uh, a typhoon got in my way, and I was stuck. I know this is going to sound terrible, but I was I was stuck for a week in Honolulu. <laughs> Yeah, because we couldn't get the Kwajalein. All the because of the the typhoon hit, um, Kwajalein escaped damage, but Guam got whacked. And the way that it works out there is the the flights have to go island hopping. So with Guam Airport out of knocked out of commission, you couldn't go to Kwajalein unless you were on a MAC flight, a military flight. Um, and so all civilian transport was uh, grounded. And so I spent. <laughs> I spent seven days in Honolulu waiting for the for the airport to open up in Guam so that the flight could get me to Kwajalein, and it never happened. So, bikini <laughs> bikini is on my bucket list. Is so that's where you're heading to next? No, uh, um, believe it or not, I, I I love diving shipwrecks. I dive uh, uh, all around the world, and one of the my favorite places to dive is the English Channel, or basically anywhere in the UK. Um, I spent um, a week, uh, I, I go almost every year, but I spent a week diving out of Eastbourne. I, I dove from, from Gosport in the east all the way to Donegal, Ireland in, in, in the west, in the western approaches. And the thing I love about UK waters is that if, it's a, if it is a lawful abandoned shipwreck, 
uh, recovery is permitted of certain artifacts as long as you report them to the receiver of wreck. So therefore, uh, a lot of these shipwrecks, a lot of the artifacts that you see uh, have been lawfully recovered from, from the shipwrecks that lay at the bottom of the English Channel. So uh, that's one of my favorite places to go diving, as you can tell. And if people want to learn more about what you've got going on, uh, is the website uh, richiekohler.com? You got it. And the YouTube channel, simply search for Richie, Richie Kohler, and you're going you're gonna to come up with it. Uh, yeah, if you guys have not checked out uh, the other videos out there of Richie's activities, I strongly recommend it. The video where he was commenting earlier, you can find that on his YouTube channel. Check it out. Become a subscriber. You guys are going to love it. I was hooked on it. Uh, so it's all good stuff. Richie Kohler, thank you for joining us tonight. I can't say that enough. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Thank you, Richie. All right, man. So we're going to let you go, and then we're going to talk behind your back. There you go. <laughs> All right. You Hello. you have you have Thank a you, uh, yeah. You have a great night. Bye now. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> well, I'll get that banner down. Oh, oh I got it. I got it. So what the hell was that all about? <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah um, that was pretty fascinating. It was. Mm -hmm. I one thing I noticed right off the bat, I've not been on a U boat, but I've been on three World War II American subs, and you can definitely tell there's a size difference, even just through that video. Uh, it, they seemed more compact for sure than their American counterparts. That's something that I noticed right off the bat when I was looking at that footage. You, well, I mean, uh, what he was giving and describing, you know, in the engine room, and he says, well, it's about two meters or six feet or whatever. If that, that silt might be four feet of off the deck. Yeah. Right. So, I, I mean, I get it. It, it seems pretty, the mm -hmm. diameter of the pressure hull uh, doesn't seem that great, but. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, I, if, if I can. Yes. If I, I mean, can, if you're yeah, taking you part of that. Yeah. Well, I was referring more to like the width, like not so much the height, but like the width. It just seemed smaller. But I, well, well, yeah, I know, I, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. The I other know. thing I'm going to make a comment on is our museum has a partial collection from a museum that was known as the Wheelhouse Museum that was open in Ottawa until the late '70s, and their collection was almost entirely shipwreck artifacts that they had basically gotten divers to go and take from across the Great Lakes and the Atlantic. Uh, and that was very interesting to just kind of hear his opinion on the display and the removal of these artifacts because it's something we're still working our way through ourselves. There's Our cargo hold still has a bunch of stuff that I'm trying to figure out whether or not we should display or should we just keep hitting away and yeah any any word is always appreciated on that so oh just from what i'm dealing with personally richie uh, just sent an email basically saying great chat look forward to seeing the edited version if you're serious about me coming back i would be more than happy so 100 yeah i'd, I'd love yeah. to have him back um i thought he was fantastic yeah so one of the things that i was so, uh, well, I, I mean, I guess it was covered. It was, I'd like to do a little, and I have not read the book. And as I said, I was a virgin with this story, but so it'd be well, interesting. Did, okay. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Let me inter interrupt you. Since you did not know the story and, um, you did not, you didn't know him from like deep sea detectives on the history channel. What are your thoughts? I mean, that's, that was a very moving story and he's had many years to tell it rightly. Right, like he he hit all of the major points to me about uh, remembering and forgetting and the families and how important it was as a war wreck artifact uh, to treat it rightly, and mm -hmm. that uh, was and he tells it in a very compelling way. Um, I, I wanted to hear more, and I guess maybe I should read the book about about that miscommunication with the radio, you know. Yeah. 
did they not have their antenna up or it's in the book yeah okay yeah. thank you yeah I, I might have to read through that but yeah that was very compelling to me is how they missed orders and then all of a sudden this happens and why uh, uh yeah they uh thanks frank <laughs> yeah well, well thank I, you. Yeah, Thanks, definitely check, check check out the Nova documentary too. What was interesting, and uh, you know, I could have kept him on and asked about this. What was interesting about the Nova documentary, you know, he said that they didn't want to air it until family members were notified, that type of thing. But once the Nova documentary aired, apparently in Germany, a crew member of the U eight six nine actually came forward. And he was, he was, I forget why he was off the sub, but he uh, was sick. Was that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. So he was sick. Yeah. He was taken off the sub or he, he left the sub and that's when it went on its last voyage. And he was always under the impression that it had gone down off of Rabat, you know, by Casablanca and I forget the guy's name, you know, but there's really some interesting stories, you know, because there was an interview about him. He was a radio man. Also that Horenberg guy who had carved his name in the knife was the radio was like one of the, the lead radio men hmm. on the sub. And he made the comment. It's like, Hey, look, you know, did, could Hornberg have made a mistake in the broadcast? He said, absolutely not. That guy knew what he was doing. So hmm. uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a real interesting Real interesting story. And does it also mention how many actually family members of the crew that he they they were able to locate? That I don't remember. John, okay. do, you, do you recall that? I don't. No. I don't no. maybe. Um one thing though, he talks about finding remains and you know, he pauses the video and all that. So when he sees remains, and then I, I can't help but wonder what goes through his mind when he starts to see pictures like this. Yeah. You know, of the crew. Mm -hmm. um anyway fascinating yeah, yeah. yeah. A, part of, a part of me when he talked about the remains and just bringing this to my field of expertise but a part of whenever when he brought the remains a part of me brought up story in my mind brought up stories of the cam loops which is a freighter which sank on lake superior and it's in such cold water that the bodies of the crew are still aboard and divers who have gone down there basically swim past the bodies that are still floating and they haven't turned into skeletons because there's nothing there to yeah there's a whole thing about the chief engineer supposedly following people if they enter the engine room and stuff like that and like to me when i hear that stuff and i i that to me that's like the most vivid story of a uh, of a body that I've ever heard. So my brain instantly goes to the cam loops when I hear about that. Mm. Mm. Um, well, okay. So we're, we're at two hours. I need to be sensitive to you guys because you're on Eastern time <laughs> and I'm central. But uh, so what I'm, what I'm going to do is um, get uh so shane with the buffalo naval park what what are you guys doing this week i'm assuming everything is shut down over there yeah we're we're shut down um uh, a lot of work has begun starting uh you know throughout the year we were uh getting ready for the winterization plans especially for the sullivans so that has kind of taken its uh uh that is kind of Kind of wrapping up now uh went earnest and gangbusters uh when we closed in late november uh so there's still a lot of work going on board um you know i've been able to start processing collections again which is something i really enjoy uh because i have about a year and a half backlog of things and now i'm finally emailing people back you know from thank you i received your donation a year ago and i'm just beginning to process it now and and so that's <laughs> enjoyable to do uh to finally let the people know that i've uh started yeah. processing their family's collection uh you know i, I mean we have uh we're, you know a lot of plans one of the big things here in Buffalo that's taking place is on April 8th, we are part of that total eclipse blackout. 
that's coming and they're expecting a million people to come into the city of Buffalo or, you know, the West Buffalo and Western New York region. Wow. And uh, so we are opening up the ships. It's uh, Monday. I think it's Monday, uh, April 8th. So we're opening up the ships uh, for VIP viewing. Because as you can see in that photo right there, the sun is kind of, and we're sectioning off various parts of the Little Rock and they can come aboard, spend the night on a Sunday night and uh, and then view it in the afternoon on uh, April 8th on Monday. So there's been a lot of planning about that. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're just kind of full speed ahead yeah. for the off season. How's the Talos missile coming along? Oh, the Talos. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, Connor. Uh, so the for the Talos missile, you know, the Talos missile itself is clean, done, wrapped. Uh, we primed, as and many people know if they've been watching. Thank you for that. Uh, it, and then I was getting to the painting. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to get a spray gun and I'm just going to do it myself. We had a lot of dedicated volunteers, but... Um, you know, I, it might just be a one-person job or a two-person job. So, and then the company where it's at, uh, Bidco, said, "You know what, Shane? If you probably haven't spray, you know, painted with a uh, sprayer before, we're like." So I heard that from multiple people. So I was like, "Okay, I'm getting the hint. Like, it shouldn't be me." <clears throat> so Bidco has offered to actually paint it on two coats of that off-white paint uh, that I supplied for them. So they're going to be doing that. Um, I've just emailed them uh, yesterday for an update. We'll see what they say. Then they'll they'll wrap it as well, and they get it into storage. Then and then in the spring, probably after uh, the eclipse, then uh, we'll barge it and bring it on board and do all of that hot work uh, to get it into the missile house. So uh, one of the big things, also, if I can say so, I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked with the. Uh, U.S. Navy Cruiser Sailors Association, and that's an organization that had at its height about 4,000 members of cruiser sailors, and uh, we are they, they shuttered their doors in December of 2022, and I've secured their records. So they are actually, I believe, shipping them from Oregon, uh, and in the library museum world, this is a really big deal if an organization closes that you become the home of their records and I will be working with them for any restricted access board of director reports. You know, this means we'll have the whole run of their newsletters uh, and magazine publications with all of those wonderful articles. So I'll be working with them about what's restricted, what is not, uh, and that's usually for the creators to decide. And then that's something else that we can open up to people who are interested in cruiser history. So uh -huh. really excited about that. That sounds awesome. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, Anything else? No. Yeah. Shane Stevenson, curator of the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park. Uh, definitely check out the YouTube channel. Search for Buffalo Naval Park in the search bar. And... Uh, Connor's dad, Rob, asked the question about the Talos missile. You're going to see updates on the Talos missile. What is it like a refurbishment or restoration project? How do you? Um, yeah, I would. Um, it was a stabilization project, and then uh, refurbishment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Restoration well, means we would be putting solid rocket fuel back in it and launching it. Uh, so. <laughs> No, it's I'm just sure the Navy would love that. Yeah, that, just, that, that, now that that'd be a video. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be awesome. Awesome. We're not, we're, not uh -huh. we're just rehabilitating it. Well, so. check out the Buffalo Naval Park's Facebook uh, page for that. Plenty of posts about the um, stabilization of the Talos missile. It's it's fascinating stuff. Shane Stevenson's, like I said, curator of the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park. Uh, let's see. Moving on to, bear with me a second. Are you guys able to comment? What? Right now, I'm trying to send a comment, but it's it's giving me an error. It's been glitchy all night. Has it? Okay. Oh, has it? Okay. I I wasn't aware. Um, all right, John Epp, curator at the USS Slater in Albany, New York. John sent me a pretty cool picture that he wants 
posted and I apologize. The window actually shut down, but I'm going to bring it back up. Well, to, to answer Stinky the Skunk's question, are you ever bringing the Slater to Rochester? Um, give us a few million dollars and we'll consider getting the ball to <laughs> Yeah, right. Sure. Let's see um, here. Oh, oh, that is it. Okay, there we go. Are oh, you a Mac guy? I didn't know that. What? You're a Mac person? Oh, God, yeah. Oh. How do you know that? L you just know. Know. <laughs> Oh, you can? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, John sent me this email with this picture. Uh, what's the deal here? So um, if you follow us on Facebook, you'll see we just posted that last week. So every winter we do a, a winter um, fundraiser. Um, keep a, a volunteer warm this winter. And this is the picture we use. That's the Slater. Probably December of 44, maybe January of 45. Um, we're just hanging out outside and this ship was covered in ice. So we use this to advertise uh, that we're closed for the winter, uh, throw us a few dollar donation, keep the heat on, um, things like that. And if anyone had noticed throughout the night, I've been wearing a winter hat. We sell uh, USS Slater winter hats in our gift shop. And um, <laughs> feel free. You I didn't. <laughs> U USS Slater.org slash ships desk store. You can buy a, Nice USS Slater watch cap. Well, that's, Ooh, that's a cool. good idea. Christmas actually. is right around the uh, the corner. Um, hey, going back to this picture where the ship's all iced up, that's yeah. got to be that's obviously North North Atlantic convoy duty. Um, it, most it, it's either a convoy duty or they're probably off Casco Bay, Maine, doing a training exercise. Um, I hate what I love about this exercise. this picture is. The ship is different today. Uh, the two 20 millimeters up in front of the pilot house is only one there nowadays. Uh, behind the guy that's just standing there, that can barely move, he's fully bundled up. There's uh, an extra three inch ready service locker that's not there anymore. The hedgehog launcher has a, a barrier on the front that's not there. So um, I, I know I haven't been making videos on YouTube. That's probably going to change here shortly. Um, I'm thinking of doing a video on a destroyer escort that went through a typhoon in June of 45 off Okinawa. Um, they hit a, they rolled 70, 75 degrees without capsizing. Um, I did a, I did an interview with a veteran that was on an LST in 45 mm -hmm. off Okinawa. It had to be the same typhoon. He was yeah, talking was about, typhoon. Yep. yeah, he was talking about that storm. And how the LST was just all over the place. He's trying to brace himself in his bunk. It was awful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Three, second typhoon, right? Yeah. Would it have been? Um, but on this DE, uh, two guys were washed overboard from the flying bridge. Uh, wow. One was rescued hours later by another ship. The second guy was washed into the ocean, and then a wave pushed him back onto the ship onto the fantail. <laughs> Um, but uh, somebody lucky. somebody inside the ship was killed. He fell down a ladder when the ship rolled seventy five degrees. Um, so I'm thinking of making a video on that. Maybe this week we'll see. Um, That'd be amazing. Other things going on at the ship, uh, like Shane will close down for the winter. Some maintenance projects. There's a twenty foot section of wasted steel on the starboard side in the officers wardroom and the exos cabin that we mm -hmm. our volunteers have started to take the insulation away. They're actually going to cut out the bulkhead and uh, put new steel in. Actually, it's, you can see it in this picture right here. It's, it's um, the life raft on the superstructure directly below that. It's wasted steel, about six inches tall. It has to be replaced. So you're, um, so it's coming through the outs. So it's rusting from the inside out. Uh, yeah, from the outside in, uh, water had sat on the deck, and the porthole was leaky. This is this is going back. This is decades of of leakage. Um, actually, in in 1993, the Greeks dry docked the ship prior to giving it to us, and there were portholes missing in the wardroom. Like mm. there was, it was just wide open. So water has yeah. been getting in. Um, oh, so you know, you're so, saying at the uh, you're saying at the the junction with the deck and the deck. Deck house. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. We replaced it a little bit last winter on the port side. Uh, this winter is the starboard side. Unfortunately, it extends into the XO's cabin 
under his bunk. Uh, so that mm. it's all, it's going to be an entire winter project aft all the way aft uh, under one of the birthing compartments. Um, we've emptied out two of the magazines. We just fill with a bunch of stuff storage. Uh, so that's going to get restored. Uh, we might, maybe I'll, we'll, we'll do a video on that as well. We'll see. But if you follow us on Facebook, you'll see all the, the progress as this goes on during the winter. Um, and the last but not least, what I've been working on, is, um, and I mentioned it, I think, once before. I'll quickly share the screen. Um, Wait a second. You'll share your screen now, but you made me actually, you had to email that picture to me and made me do all that. I, I got to let you do some work. Oh, geez. Um, so uh, we use Past Perfect 5 for our collections database and to track our memberships and donations, things like that. Uh, but Past Perfect also has a service where you can directly upload from that program to their website and um, you can host collections. So I am uh, slowly going alphabetically, ship uh, destroyer escort by destroyer escort. You see, I'm only into, into D right now. And there's 600 ships, <laughs> um, but you can click and, and there are ships missing. We, you know, we, we don't have things for every destroyer escort, but I mean, if anyone's ever interested, interested, you can go on here. It's just ussslater.passperfectonline.com. You can also find it through our website directly. But I mean, you can look at photos. It's, it's. I mean, look at that. I mean, the one point one inch gun barrel that exploded. What? Um, on the Connolly. So you're grouping photos from your collection by ship. Yeah. So all of our collections at the at, at the museum are grouped into a ship collection if we can right yeah so and so um, but you're saying you're right there's just de's that you don't have photographs for or documents or artifacts anything right? um yeah there are sh some ships we have things for that are not on the website uh that i need to go and get updated photographs because you know the photograph was taken 20 years ago Right. And you can't, you know, you can't zoom in and read anything. So um, that's an ongoing project. This is a multi-year project right here, but mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's just one way. If you can't visit the ship, at least you can look at a few things and um, and do that. So nice. that's what I've been working on. You can zoom in a little bit, and everything is watermarked. You can't see it in this picture, but it is watermarked at the bottom. So hopefully, no stealing. Skills. Yeah, yeah. Stealing is bad, people. Don't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Doesn't uh, it have a block for right click save? Like, isn't there a right click save block with a block? No. Uh, nope. You can, you can still save it, but um, I'll quickly find, like, I'll probably in this now. picture. <laughs> it's very, you see, it's crazy. At the bottom there. So. I want to hear the that's stories. A former, that's a former board member. That's his ship. Um, it exploded during. Uh, they were shooting at a mine, I believe, and this was his gun, and it exploded, and he pocketed the shell fragments and gave it to us in the early 90s, and they're on display at the museum right now. Really? Parts of that. Yeah, that barrel. So, All right, but, I'll stop. Well, but how did that happen? Just blew up. Yeah. It just blew up. I mean. Accidents happen. Oh they didn't change God. the barrel in time, obviously. <laughs> Damn. Okay. And the one, the one point one inch was notorious for jamming and whatnot. Yeah, a lot of the sure escorts had these. Yeah. Huh. So. Okay. I mean, I that's a great photo. Yeah. But what's great is you know people are now going on this website, not seeing their dad ship or whoever's ship, and then you can email me at the top here. And then I can get stuff together and send it directly to that person, nice. which opens up a whole nother avenue of possible donors. Yeah. Will um, you ever offer a virtual tour? We we kind of have a virtual tour on our website. Um, that we fit that Shannon film with a 360 GoPro. It doesn't go through the entire ship, um, but there is some stuff there. Yeah, the reason he asks is because we're debating doing the same thing on our ship. You some some museums don't want to put like the entire tour out online. Yeah, because we're will that detract thinking, from people yeah. wanting to come visit it? Yeah. I well, don't I don't thinking, really believe that, but 
what we're thinking primarily is parts of the ship that aren't on the regular tour route right now, like the engine rooms, uh, cargo holds, things yeah. like that. We have some videos on our website. Um, during COVID, we had the idea to create small mini tours mm -hmm. with our tour guides. We never finished it for various reasons, um, but we're thinking of redoing that as well. Yeah, we have three. We have all three virtual tours of our ships through the tour routes. Uh, but the mm -hmm. whole ship, the whole tour route, that's available on our website too. So, it's yes, a nice resource. Yeah, actually, uh, the same guy who asked the question asked again. Uh, you part, part of the reason why we we're doing it oh, is yeah. because we're thinking about people with disabilities who might come to the site, can't see, and we might have a little thing right here for you to look through. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's the other part of our reasoning. If someone can't get on the ship, they're in a wheelchair or they can't go up and down the ladders, yeah, um, you know, at least we could still show them or at least give them a link to a tour, yeah, um, which we do have. Uh, but I don't think it's publicly available. Okay. Okay. Anything, well, else, anything else from the Slater? Um, I don't think so. If you want to keep me warm in the winter, donate 20 bucks. <laughs> pay the electric bill. It yeah, without, cold in with, my office. Without a doubt. USSlater.org. Check it out. Keep John warm. You're in the... You're in the aft end of the ship, correct? Yeah, I'm in the supply office in 203, yeah, all the way aft. That uh, that can't be a warm spot. Uh, check out the USS Slater's YouTube channel in the search bar, enterusslater.com. John has promised he's going to start making videos again. Um, but you guys are posting content. You know, it's not like it's come to a come to a stop or anything like that. So check out their YouTube channel. It's great stuff. And as I always say, you know, one of the best ways you can support these guys is to not only watch the content, click and subscribe. Definitely helps them out. And moving on to me. Hold on a second. Oh, what happened? Oh, there it goes. There it goes. The Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay, Alexander Henry uh, Icebreaker, Connor Kilgore. What's going on? Uh, well, we've also winterized our ship, so we're completely closed down for the season. Uh, our Haunted Harbor was a huge success. Uh, we made, collectively, between ourselves, uh, our partners at Our Kids Count, and with Capital Players, who I think were the actors, uh, we made a grand total of uh, $27,000, really? uh, which was split between the three of us. Uh, to comparison, last year's event was only $8,000 total. So this was a absolutely amazing event and probably a great way for us to cap off this season. Uh, we're looking forward to next year for sure. And we can't wait to work with our partners again. Uh, now, the other big thing of note is uh, over this winter, uh, I've been in the process of getting a lot of our collection digitized. Uh, much of our collection has not been up to this point. Uh, so I recently managed to get a hold of a volunteer who has a museum quality film scanner. And we're going, yep, that's our website. Uh, and we'll be, you, so we'll yeah, put it back. We'll be working on that over the winter months. I can't wait for that. And we're also looking at possibilities to get uh, some 16 millimeter footage digitized as well. So that's kind of my big project right now is that um, tomorrow is our last big more board meeting of the year. So we'll be doing a summary then. Uh, and then basically for us, uh, we're working on our plans for the new year. Uh, we're slowly working our way through our new gift shop plans for next year, new items that will be available. Uh, so will be new merchandise. Uh, we won't be reusing some stuff from last year. Uh, and basically, we're also working on new displays for the museum. One thing I'm really looking at is rearranging some of the pre-existing displays as uh, the display rooms have remained pretty much uh, still for the last... Uh, five years now so basically since our existence so we're starting to see a few changes on site and uh should be exciting 
Uh, but yeah, uh, I did think I mentioned last month that we did become a national heritage site here in Canada. So uh, that opens up some opportunities for us as well. And uh, things are looking up for us in the uh, near future. So we can't wait to welcome people back next year. And I think that's about it. Uh, any questions at all from you guys? No, no. Uh, to learn more about what's going on for the oh, John? Wait, okay, question. How much ice do you have? None yet. Uh, we have a little bit of ice forming. A uh, little bit of ice forming, but much, honestly, it's kind of disturbing. Uh, there's not been that much snow or ice yet, although we do have considerably cold winds. It's just not staying cloudy enough long enough, and the sun is just strong enough still to keep melting it. So hopefully that's uh that changes because i do not want to see where we're sitting uh next spring if we don't get ice so it's it's unusual for this time of year shane you do you guys have snow or, uh in buffalo right now no no we had a very small snow lake effect snow but it melted the next day so we just kind of resign ourselves to the fact that we will not really get snow in december anymore Okay. And then the real major months, it's now shifted to January and February. We have had a couple 55 mile an hour windstorms. Yep. Uh, so, you know, we checked that out. Uh, we The past four or five years, we've been getting up to 75 uh, mile per hour windstorms, which is, you know, it causes some mm -hmm. of the serious damage to the Sullivans and other our other vessels. So. Uh, you know, it's, it's always kind of a constant monitoring the, the river level uh wind but yeah so right now no snow it's supposed to be 50 degrees this weekend here yeah. in buffalo so it's you know i think everything's just shifted that month to uh january and february now it's it's very unusual for lake superior very unusual yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's warm here too in minneapolis uh, yeah, i should be under a foot of snow by now yeah <laughs> uh let's see connor kilgore with the Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay to learn more about what they've got going on and the <laughs> Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker Alexander Henry, visit www.tmtb.ca. Anything else you want me to add there, Connor? Uh, no. Uh, everyone have a great Christmas. Happy holidays. And uh, we'll see you New Year's Eve. Yeah, I want to say thanks to Richie Kohler for joining us tonight. That was a thrill. He stayed on yeah. a hell of a lot longer than we originally talked about, talked about a half hour and, you know, we were at about an hour and 45 minutes and he did send me an email saying that he wanted to come back on. So that's fantastic. We'll have him on again. So definitely want to say thanks to Richie Kohler. Check out richiekohler.com and you can search for his YouTube channel, Richie Kohler in the uh, search bar. So definitely check it out. Uh, good videos on there. And as he alluded He's going other places. He still continues to dive all the time. So there's all kinds of great photos and video to check out there. So thanks to Richie. Uh, if he gets to Bikini, he could take photos of the orange painted Nevada, USS Nevada. Well, orange. did the Nevada actually go down in, in Bikini? Because that thing wouldn't sink. No, I think they sank her off the coast of Hawaii. Yeah, they, oh, they, they told yeah, it out okay. of there, I thought. I thought she went down. Yeah, it was New York that went down, I think. Mm. Or the Pennsylvania. The oh, Prince yeah. Eugen is capsized, right? Yeah, P uh, Prince Eugen's there, yeah. yeah. Uh, just as a side note, uh, our current chair at our museum has dived Bikini Atoll. He's a world-class diver himself. Uh, and uh, he's actually dived on the Nagato as well as the Saratoga. So, wow. yeah. He, he continuously reminds me of those stories every time the subject yeah. comes up. There's, there's all kinds of amazing historic ships that went down there as part of oh, that yeah. atomic yeah. fleet. Um, hell, we could, do, we could do an episode about that. It would just turn to us ranting for two hours. Yeah, probably, probably. All right, with that being uh, said, thank you everyone for uh, joining us tonight. It was a long episode, but it was totally worth it. Hope you enjoyed it. I know I definitely did. And we'll have Richie Kohler on again in the future. For John Epp on the Slater, Shane Stevenson, Buffalo Naval Park, and Connor Kilgore, Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay, my name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X. Thanks for watching tonight, and everyone have a good evening.
Not everybody.